एक दुष्कर कार्य है इसी को ध्यान में रखते हुए इस सुविधा का यहाँ पर की स्थापना की गई है और एक्सेलरेटर के तौर पर हमारे पास कई प्रकार के एक्सेलरेटर्स हैं और आज के इस व्याख्यान में आपको एक संक्षिप्त परिचय प्रस्तुत किया जाएगा कि किस प्रकार आप इन सुविधाओं का उपयोग कर सकते हैं आने वाले दिनों में हमारे पास एक तीन पेटा फ्लॉप का सुपर कंप्यूटिंग फैसिलिटी भी हम लोग जो पहले थी उसको करके एक नई सुविधा रखेंगे तो जो लोग रिमोटली लॉग इन करके साइंटिफिक जिनको आवश्यकता होगी मॉडलिंग के लिए सिमुलेशन उनका वो उपयोग घर बैठे ही कर सकते हैं कर, कर सकेंगे एक और भी बड़ी सुविधा यहाँ पर विकसित हो रही है वो है जियोक्रोलॉजी यानी कि आप आयु निर्धारण कर सकते हैं जो कार्बन डेटिंग जिसके बारे में आपने पढ़ा था उससे कहीं अधिक उन्नत किस्म की सुविधा आपके समक्ष उपलब्ध है न केवल पुरातात्विक बल्कि विभिन्न क्षेत्रों में चाहे वो सामुद्रिक विज्ञान हो चाहे वो जियोलॉजी हो भूगर्भ विज्ञान हो चाहे हो इन सभी क्षेत्रों में विधाओं में इस डेटिंग का आप बहुतायत से प्रयोग कर सकते हैं और बहुतायत से प्रयोग करने का तात्पर्य यह है कि वो अनसुलझे जो साइंटिफिक पहलू हैं उनको सुलझा सकते हैं जो एक्सलरेटर्स यहाँ पर हैं उनका उपयोग हम लोग न्यूक्लियर फिजिक्स में एटॉमिक फिजिक्स में मॉलिकुलर फिजिक्स में और मेटीरियल साइंस तथा रेडिएशन बायोलॉजी में करते हैं अब धीरे धीरे हम लोग इस दिशा में जा रहे हैं कि देश को आत्मनिर्भर बनाने के लिए अगर मटेरियल साइंस में काम करना है तो आपको नई डिवाइसेस के लिए नए प्रकार के जो मटेरियल हैं उनको विकसित करने की कला आनी चाहिए और उस पर उस कला में पारंगत होकर के आप मटेरियल की प्रॉपर्टी को अपने मनचाहे ढंग से टेलर कर सकते हैं उनको उनमें बदलाव ला सकते हैं और उसका उपयोग आप डिवाइसेस के लिए कर सकते हैं तो आप सभी का इस संक्षिप्त परिचय के बाद मेरा अनुरोध होगा कि कुलपति महोदय हैं तो उनके अभिभाषण के बाद इस एकेडमिक सेशन को तो जारी रखेंगे धन्यवाद रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर मनोज दीक्षित वाइस चांसलर ऑफ राम मनोहर लोहिया अवध यूनिवर्सिटी टू काइंडली एड्रेस द गैदरिंग greetings from new delhi so uh, we are meeting in the middle of one pandemic uh, a difficult time the human kind had uh, ever encountered however it is a pleasure to note that we have almost 200 uh, participants registered for this event and most of the participants have already joined and it is actually uh, very encouraging to have Uh, these many participants for such events in the middle of some difficult times so it actually gives uh, gives us uh, energy and it actually uh, uplift our spirit to continue our activities as an academician so with this we can go to the technical session i uh, uh, we will be starting with dr pankaj kumar Dr. Pankaj Kumar is a senior scientist at Indore University Accelerator Center, New Delhi. He is the main person behind the geochronology facility of IUSC, Delhi, and he has experience in carbon dating to a large extent. 
and he uh, he has been helping the users in using the carbon dating facility at Inder University Accelerator Center. Uh, I invite Dr. Pankaj Kumar for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Olda. I will uh, share my slides and then give the presentation. Yeah, I, I request please switch up the video for the bandwidth on the person who has switched on the video. Please uh, stop video so that actually you can get the full bandwidth for presentation. Okay, is the slides are uh, slides are visible to all of you? Dr. Sahu, can you please? Yeah, 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 sure. That's all. Okay. And I would like to know that the, all the proceedings we are recording, so later it will be available also for the participants if you want. Yeah. Hello, good morning, uh, everyone. As our uh, honorable uh, director, uh, Professor Pandey said that. Uh, it is our, you know, uh, normally we used to go to the university for conducting acutance, acutance, acutance program, but this time due to pandemic, everything has moved to online. And uh, so uh, I welcome you all on behalf of IOC to be part of this acutance program. And uh, the talk, uh, which is titled for me is Introdu Introduction to Ion Accelerators and Geochronology Facilities at IUSC. All of this is being recorded and it will be made available to you later on. But in case if you have question, you can write us. I have given the email IDs here. Any question uh, can be uh, you know, addressed to us and uh, which we, we can uh, answer you by email. And at present, if anyone having any question, he can go to the chat box and write down the question. So later we will read them and the like speaker will like to answer those questions. The questions you can uh, type in the chat box. If, regarding the presentation, if any questions are there, you please type. So we will read it out and uh, the speaker will be able to answer some of the queries. Right. Okay. okay so. Uh, Inter-University Accelerator Center is the first inter-university center of in University Grants Commission. It was established in 1984 as an autonomous institution. And uh, you see this uh, laser pointer. You see this. Uh, Pankaj, Pankaj, uh, can, 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 Pankaj. Pankaj, can you, can you, can you stop for a while? Our vice chancellor has just now joined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, sure. so maybe he can address the gathering. So you could stop. Yeah, sharing yeah, yeah. Sure. I will stop sharing and then uh, I will request uh, uh, the vice chancellor. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Hello. Can I, Can you hear me? Yes. yes, 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 we can hear. Suddenly, my camera seems to. Oh, yeah, you can see now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Verma. Uh, participants from, uh, I think, almost everywhere. I can see my young colleague, Raji Manor, also uh, among the participants. Yes, speaker. Uh, pardon? Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, I can understand this uh, this uh, IUAC acquaintance program and one day national workshop on accelerator based research, which has been jointly organized by the University Accelerator Center New Delhi and uh, our university 
uh, on this particular platform and i'm uh, i'm absolutely uh, hopeful that uh, under the patronage of uh, department of physics and electronics and uh, uh, gold lakh kumaran synthesis uh, and the friends uh, you will be able to uh, achieve the system uh, the entire thought process is uh, going through a sea change and uh, as an academia i can i will i will always welcome this uh, welcome this because it it poses a challenge to us and uh, we have to be equal to the challenge and uh, the kind of uh, research that we've been doing traditionally in conventional system and uh, the kind of research is now uh, that will be done uh, there there is going to be of course a sea change in this and i am i am absolutely hopeful that uh, you know iuac and uh, our university and the probably the, the the conglomeration of lot of universities and iits and all the will be able to meet the challenges posed by this particular scenario and uh, do all the work on on virtual space with uh, quality assurance at hand and also the the long cherished traditional value system that indian students always had that there is a challenge to that too so all this is going to happen uh, today and it is going to happen in new future and uh, it is good that uh, golda and our team are going to organize this workshop for all of us and i am i am very very sure that the students of uh, uh, rml university would have a great opportunity of participating in an exercise like this also the faculty members and i i wish uh, your program and the program Uh, organized in the similar vein by the department of physics and electronics a uh, great success and uh, as usual i always though i am not a scientist uh, i am a researcher definitely uh, and i wish that the, the whatever is uh, transpires here and the recommendations and the gist of the recommendations is also submitted to us for taking up further and implementing them uh, for the benefit of uh, the community at large Uh, my best wishes and thank you very much for inviting me here i'm sorry dr pankaj for intervening in between there were some technical reasons why i could join late only thank you so much and god bless you all thank you sir thank you sir for joining us thank you very much yeah dr pankaj you, you may please continue Okay, so uh, coming back, um, IUC. It is uh, as I said earlier that the first inter-university center of UGC, and it is it was established in 1984. Where you see this, uh, uh, you see this uh, big tower. In fact, it houses one accelerator, and that was the first accelerators accelerator at IUC. and this accelerator was operational became operational in 1991 so the mission of iuc earlier when it was known as nuclear science center the mission is um, that uh, iuc is committed to provide within the university system world class facilities for accelerator based internationally competitive research in focused areas of nuclear physics materials science atomic physics and radiation biology of course with time we expanded our mission and then uh, you know moved towards the application of accelerator or utilizing the accelerator in earth and environmental sciences also and uh, now i should say that accelerate mass spectrometry and geochronology program is one of the big program of iuc in addition to this Uh, providing the facility iuc is also work, working towards developing new accelerators 
augmenting the accelerators. Uh, you will see all these things in my talk. So who can use IOC facilities? Anyone who is doing research, whether he comes from a university, college, IIT, NIT, or any other institute or organization in India or abroad, they can come and utilize IOC instrumentation. Um, of course, the, the program, the research which they are doing should match the theme or the instrumentation which we have, uh, uh, which is mainly uh, we do that we uh, uh, use ion beams of energies ranging from few kVs to hundreds of mEV. So utilizing these ex these uh, energy ion beams of this energy range, anyone working in any of these institution can utilize our facilities. Um, as I said earlier, that uh, we have the facilities or the dedicated beam lines for performing the experiments in nuclear physics, material science, atomic molecular physics, radiation biology, and then accelerator mass spectrometry. Further, we have some other instrumentations other than accelerators for, for performing research in geochronology. So details on how to apply for beam time or how to utilize these uh, facilities, it will be presented later in the day. Uh, coming to the introduction and overview of the accelerators, in fact, IUC has many accelerators, and I have divided them in um, three categories. First is tandem accelerators. So they are the DC accelerators, and uh, the working principle of all these three accelerator, accelerators is same. As I, as I showed you earlier, that uh, a big uh, tower that houses a 15 UD palatron accelerator and it's running from uh, almost 30 years, last 30 years. And then there is another palatron accelerator having a, a voltage of 1.7 million volts. This is also running from almost uh, last 10 years. And then there is one more palatron accelerator having a potential of 500 kilovolt, which is being operational since last five years. And then we have ready frequency accelerators where uh, superconducting linear accelerator is there. You will see this, I will give a little bit, uh, you know, a brief of this accelerator also. And then we are, uh, this, this one high current injector, this is under development. And then in lower energy side, the electron volt energy accelerators, we have positive ion, uh, low energy beam facility for positive ions, and this is, uh, ECR based, that is basically electron cyclotron resonance based ion source. And then we have a negative, uh, the low energy accelerator for providing negative ion beam. And uh, it is based on the source, ion source of these accelerators. And then there is very small tabletop accelerator, 50 kilovolt accelerator, is also in house development by some of our scientists and engineer. IOC is also working to, to develop a daily light source. This is under development and uh, this is basically, I will also talk about it later on. So now I will go through one by one uh, on, uh, about and tell about all these uh, accelerators. Okay, so this is the pictorial view of all these accelerators at IOC. This is the inside view of 15 UD electron accelerator, the oldest one here. And this is the schematic, schematic of linear accelerator. And this is the picture of 1.7 million volt electron accelerator, which is primarily utilized for other four backscattering studies. And this is the 500 kilovolt electron accelerator, which is utilized for AMS, accelerator mass spectrometry measurements. And then these two are the or basically these three are the low energy accelerators. This one is the negative ion beam facility, and this is the positive ion beam facility, and this is a picture of tabletop 50 kilovolt accelerator. Okay, so the first uh, 15 EV accelerator, this, uh, as I told you that there is a tower in which this accelerator is house, housed, 
and on the top floor we have ion source where the negative ions are generated and those negative ions they come down and they are accelerated using this you know accelerator and then they are utilized at various places in the beam hall one so this is uh, the tank which is uh, is quite high around 27 meter and having a diameter of 5.5 meter and whole of this accelerator inside of this is filled with the sulfur hexachloride gas for insulating uh, the terminal to the uh, body of the uh, accelerator and uh, ions any ion starting from hydrogen to gold can be accelerated using this accelerator and utilized in these areas So this is once again the schematic uh, uh, of uh, tandem accelerator, ion source, and then there is a magnet. This is accelerator. There are the provision or there are the you know mechanism for enhancing the voltage of this accelerator, which is at the middle point, high voltage terminal. And then the ion source basically produces the negative ion, and then they come down at the terminal. The charge state of this negative ion gets Convert it into positive ion for further energy gain, and then it goes into the experimental area. So I'm not really going very much into the, into the detail. It we'll just give you some glimpse. So the energy, how we calculate the energy? So from the ion source, when the negative ions are produced, they get some initial energy push from the ion source. That is basically, if you say that that that's E zero. And then singly charged negative ions are allowed to go into the accelerator and consider that the potential at terminal is V. So then the energy gain will be charge state into V and charge state is one here. So one into V. And when these negative ions, they pass through a thin foil or a gas material, they convert into the positive ion and let's say after positive uh, after this conversion the charge state is q and voltage is again v here this magnet and this magnet is, is at the ground potential so the the energy gain would be q into v so one can you know use this formula to calculate the energy roughly if you if i take some example uh, when the voltage is 13 million volt and the Q is 10, the energy from this accelerator one can achieve around 143 million electron volt. Of course, the Q and V, all these things you know, depends on a lot of you know on user requirement as well as um, the foil or gas stripper or the mass or the atomic number of the incoming beam. So these things can vary according to the requirement. But of course, there is a limit. So what is the limit? So you see this picture. Here is the mass and this is the energy per nucleon. So if we, so, so as I said that there is a mechanism at the terminal of the accelerator uh, of 15 will be accelerator. Either you can use the gas for converting negative ion, ion into positive or you can use the foil, which is solid. So if you use gas plus foil, you follow this uh, curve. And if you use uh, foil only, you follow this curve. So um, let's say you, uh, so the energy, you, you see when you, uh, in the lower mass region, you have the enough energy, uh, which is around eight, maybe per nucleon. Okay, so this is the basically Coulomb barrier curve. To study any interaction between the two nuclei, so there is a uh, you know uh, the force uh, and uh, or there is a barrier which you have to overcome to study uh, the interaction of target and projectile. So using X, this is palladron basically. So using palladron, you can go up to here only. You can uh, study the mass of around 60. Uh, you know, uh, atomic mass unit. 
But if you increase the energy, the linear accelerator, you can reach up to 100 mass. And if you further uh, increase, increase the energy, you can reach, you can go up to around 125 mass. So to study the heavier uh, masses, you have to have higher energy. So to meet that demand, IOC developed superconducting linear accelerator. And this was entirely, it was developed in a house, where what we do that we take the accelerated ions from the pelletron and then give it to the linear accelerator to further increase the energy so that we can study the higher mass level. I request everyone to mute their mic because I see, I, I hear the echo. Okay. Now, uh, so there are three modules in so superconducting linear accelerator. In superconducting linear accelerator. Dr. Sao, can you mute everyone else other Dr. than Sao, me? Can you mute everyone else other than me? Hello. Yes. Hello. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So there are three modules okay. so for there are three modules in. Uh, Superconducting linear accelerator. Superconducting linear accelerator. Dr. Sao, are you there? Dr. Sao, are you there? Uh, Pankaj, there is Pankaj, a there reflection. Is echo. Right? Maybe, are you... Yeah, there is a uh, echo. That's what I... Somebody, somebody's mic is on. Uh, uh, yours is off because it might be coming from your... If your computer speaker is on. Yeah, but it was earlier also it was on. Well, I can use the headphone. Headphone, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we're not we're not we're not we're not we're not we're not. Uh, that's why the problem is. Hello. Uh, yes, Pankaj. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so as I was telling that uh, there are three uh, modules in linear acceler superconducting linear accelerator, and uh, each module has eight small small accelerators. You can think in that way. And each of these accelerator provide a little energy push one after other. So uh, this is how we can, you know, further uh, get higher energy. So this is the actual picture of uh, actual picture of uh, three cryo states or three modules one, two, and three. And the 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 smallest small accelerator, as I said, they are also called as cavity. So they are inside this. Uh, uh, inside these modules and this is, uh, this is the picture of uh, cavities so uh, there are eight cavities in one of the modules uh, this is how we uh, you know uh, get the energy calculated from the linear accelerator where what is involved the q the charge state which we get from the uh, peloton accelerator accelerating uh, field and effective length and this is a factor, uh, transit time factor. So if I take an example that the Q was 10 and the accelerating potential or accelerating field is 4 million volt per meter and the effective length is 0.16 meter and uh, transit time factor is 95%, uh, then the energy gain from one of the cavity would be around 6 million electron volt. So if all of our cavities are working, then we can get energy uh, gain of 144 million electron volt. So um, 143 was the energy from the peloton as we saw earlier in the earlier slide. So you can see here that the superconducting linear accelerator nearly can double the energy what we get from the peloton accelerator. Of course, this is not true for all the ions, all the ions, but it's some ballpark figure. 
so for some other uh, uh, beams like 28 silicon uh, 12 plus um, energy from the accelerator is 130 volt uh, sorry 130 linear volt and then linear, linear accelerator these are the typical you know in some experiments this has been done and that's what figure that i have given um, so uh, the energy gain from the accelerator, linear accelerator was this much. So peloton plus linear activity having energy of 10 units. How to further increase the energy? This is the formula we already know. So um, okay. So if you further want to increase the uh, energy gain, either you increase the Q, but there is a limit for every um, atom. You cannot achieve the charge state, which is higher than its atomic number, so there is a limit. Or you can increase the electric field, uh, there is also a limit for that. You cannot have a you know, um, uh, lot of electric field in one of the cavity. And if, if, similarly, the le length is also fixed. So what we do, there is only one thing which you can increase is basically Q. Of course, with the palatron, if, if you are not getting the Q, which is equal to Z, there is still a chance that you can increase the Q. And how to increase the Q? In fact, there are the uh, different type of ion sources which can provide the uh, higher charge state, higher charge state uh, uh, ions, and uh, that is the ECR ion source. And using this ion source, in fact, IUAC is working to develop. Um, another injector uh, which is which is called high current injector it will provide high current as well as higher charge state so currently we are taking the beam from the peloton accelerator tandem accelerator and giving it to the superconducting linear accelerator but this is the thing which is under development we will be having the ecr ion source and uh, the ions produced from this ion source will be um, will be accelerated by RFQ and drift tube linac, and then finally they will be going into the linear accelerator where the EY uh, energy per nucleon will be higher than what we were getting from the combination of electron plus uh, linear accelerator. And this is actual uh, you know, schematic diagram. This is the uh, ECR ion source. This is how it will travel and going into the superconducting linear accelerator. All these things are under development, which we see in near future that they will be operational, and which will really a good addition for the for the IUSC where where they even the uh, utilizing the high, uh, even higher energy uh, experiments in relevant research areas can be done. So IUSC is also working, as I said earlier, that to develop a, a, a photon uh, machine. And that is that will be called, and that is that is actually called Delhi Light Source. And uh, by having this uh, facility, uh, we can extend our research activities um, in the areas of physical, chemical, biological, and medical sciences, even. Uh, and then, uh, uh, okay, so. Uh, basically, uh, we are developing a photoinjector based electron gun which can produce the electron beam of, of around 7 uh, million electron volt. And that uh, beam will be going, sorry, that beam will be going to free electron laser, FEL. And then FEL uh, will produce the radiation in the uh, terahertz uh, hertz range. So this, this is also under development. And this is a schematic diagram where there will be experimental rooms to utilize these photons. Okay, so now in the lower energy uh, uh, beam facilities, this is the uh, uh, picture of the ion source of uh, uh, low energy positive ion beam facility, where uh, one can uh, uh, you know, get the energy, uh, several ion beams of uh, having energy from tens to uh, hundreds of kV uh, to, of course, some sub MBVs also, and there are the uh, uh, three beam lines where different types of experiments can be done. Uh, two beam lines are dedicated for uh, material science at uh, one, 
material science beam line is at 90 degree and then for atomic and molecular physics beam line is at 105 degree the third beam line is also there at 75 degree uh, angle where the highly charged ion beams can be deaccelerated and uh, deaccelerated to nearly a zero kinetic energy where you know very interesting experiments can be done and this is also called soft landing setup so this is the uh, uh, the table for uh, the ion beams of different types having different inner, uh, different charge state and uh, this is the different you know uh, current so energy uh, range is uh, from 40 kV to 4 MeV and uh, uh, you know these are the ions which can be provided the users and then this is uh, the negative ion uh, beam based uh, low energy uh, facility and uh, which is basically uh, based on a 200 kilovolt uh, uh, ion uh, source and this is the negative ion source which produces the negative ion and uh, except the inert gases all other uh, beams can be uh, produced from this ion and can be utilized in, in the beam line where uh, you know a lot of experiments can be done and this is the uh, the second peloton accelerator having a uh, which can which potential can go up to 1.7 million uh, volt and uh, this is basically primarily utilized for other feedback scattering studies and uh, thousands of samples have been uh, already done ut utilizing this uh, facility and this has a really very uh, you know unique system where the goniometer is also there uh, you can change the uh, you know detector angle and uh, at different angles a scattered beam from the sample can be studied to find out its uh, um, you know uh, impurities in the in the sample and many other interesting things um, you know the beams which uh, can be utilized from this uh, uh, accelerator source of this accelerator is helium one plus and two plus and uh, these are the different other parameters uh, for performing radio uh, brother feedback scattering studies okay so this is the 50 kilovolt tabletop accelerator this is in-house completely in-house development and uh, it's a very small one having a dimension of 1.4 to 1.6 to 1.4 to 1.5 meter uh, length width and height and uh, here uh, the one can get the uh, beams of hydrogen uh, deuterium and the helium uh, one plus and two plus and it's basically developed by um, our engineers and our scientists together to uh, you know for the purpose of uh, uh, pg and ug students to get a flavor of how accelerator works and uh, you know one can have such kind of accelerator where students can get involved um, at the university level student get can get involved and understand how the different ions are produced how uh, the vacuum is achieved and how you know ions are bent the the, the application of uh, uh, electric and magnetic field and uh, you know some experiments can also be done utilizing this tabletop accelerator. And this is, I think, commercialized and it's available for the interested, uh, you know, universities of uh, different universities who are interested to have it. Now, the last uh, uh, accelerator, which in fact I am also working in this one, that's why I kept it for last. This is, of course, the last but not the least in any way. Uh, this is uh, the schematic of that. Uh, uh, 500 kilovolt ion accelerator and uh, this is dedicated for accelerator mass spectrometry studies and this is actually the first uh, dedicated accelerator utilized for the purpose of radiocarbon dating and uh, beryllium 10 dating and aluminum 26 dating i will talk about it uh, in detail and uh, these are the sample preparation facilities also will come up now where uh, accelerator mass spectrometry is utilized. So uh, you see, uh, when you look at the nature, so what is basically the nature? Nature is uh, is nothing, nothing but its whole system of distance arrangement, 
forces events of all physical life that are not controlled by men man always does not control nature and the phenomena which are happening in the you know in the environment in the in the earth or earth atmosphere uh, uh, you know you can term them as, as a part of nature as we know that humans are part of nature but human activities are are, are not natural phenomena they are, they are the anthropogenic phenomena and uh, we always look or we always try to understand the secrets of nature whether it any science which you look at its material science you try to study the properties of uh, materials uh, which are found in the nature or or made from the elements which are found in the nature or the nuclear physics where you study the forces which are you know acting uh, between different nucleus nucleus and you know the science is nothing but it's studying the nature now in, in, in all the all the elements all the elements in the nature or or i should say everything which is in the nature is made up of individual elements or combination of the elements which are available in the periodic table so if you want to study the nature probably you need to utilize the elements which are there so um, if you closely look at this periodic table each element is composed of uh, having different isotopes some of them are stable some of them are not stable so you see these the black ones are uh, the stable isotopes and all others are unstable or the radioactive basically so uh, if you let's say want to study any phenomena which has happened in the nature you probably look you probably have to look the elements which are present in that or uh, uh, you know in that phenomena or causing that phenomena so uh, if you really want to look at what time this phenomena happened you uh, you know these unstable isotopes or the radioactive isotopes they come into the picture and they they, they can act as a chronometer they can as, act as a clock because of the reason that the radioactive elements they are decay rate is always constant irrespective of temperature of surrounding chemical other instruments and these these unstable isotopes or the radioactive isotopes they are the one which are which are basically uh, a clock and present in the nature for you so we by utilizing these clocks or, or or by utilizing these radioactive isotopes we can find out uh, the age of that particular event or age of that particular uh, you know item which is present or which is causing that event so so now now uh, we all know that the radioactive elements they decay with time and in one half life they become half at let's say that at the time of formation they will they were of uh, you know 100% after one half life they will become half and they will you know keep decreasing with time so uh, the the uh, the limitation of such a clock is 10 half life because after 10 half life the concentration of that radioactive element is so low that it's very difficult to do that or very difficult to measure so this is the limitation of this clock we utilize these radioactive elements and find out the age of different processes different uh, you know uh, artifacts or different uh, uh, i should say uh, materials which are involved in those you know so how to, uh, and 14 carbon is one of them actually 14 carbon having a half life of 5730 year is basically an ideal isotopes uh, which can uh, you know, utilize uh, to characterize the uh, development of, of human civilization as far as we know that the human civilization the oldest civilization in in uh, uh, you know in, in the world is indus valley civilization which is around uh, you know there are the claims that it's around 8 to 10000 year old and uh, you know if you utilize the 14 carbon you can uh, study uh, all these civilizations all these archaeologies uh, and archaeology materials 
uh, you know, you can date the different events which happened in the archaeology. And the beauty of 14 carbon is also that it is available everywhere. It is available in the atmosphere in the form of gas, 14 carbon CO2. It's available in the ocean in the form of calcium carbonate. Uh, and it's also available in the terrestrial biomass um, in the form of carbon, because carbon is something which is, uh, you know, building block of uh, biomass, whether human or plants. Uh, it's very easy to derive from uh, all these. Uh, uh, the 14 carbon is available. So, because of uh, all these reasons, 14 carbon is very very popular, and it is utilized in to study archaeology. Uh, to study the earth science uh, events, to study the environmental science events, and also in the glacier, uh, glacial you know uh, events happening in the glacier, uh, biomedicine, and uh, development of drug, forensic science. There are a lot of application. So now, how do we measure fourteen carbon? This is actually the instrument uh, which we utilize uh, for fourteen carbon dating. And this is one of the popular, uh, you know, uh, facility. It, it has become now quite popular lately. Um, uh, okay, this is the closer view um, uh, of of this facility. Anyway, I'm not really going into the detail of it. And as I said, that this is the first dedicated accelerator in our country, which is utilized for radio foundation. And this is the uh, pictures of uh, different instruments available. In the graphitation lab where the samples are produced, samples are prepared for dating purpose. Uh, and same thing. So what we have done, I will just give you some glimpse um, uh, utilizing the 14 carbon uh, dating. So this is uh, one of the uh, uh, research which was done in collaboration with the University of Chicago. And the student uh, is Mudit Trivedi, he was working uh, he was working in Indian problem, but at the University of Chicago, where we studied the social, uh, uh, religious, and political changes in the last millennium from archaeological excavation at Alwar in Rajasthan area. And uh, the samples were collected from there. Most of them were charcoal, and uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, studied there. And uh, results of all this uh, after dating, they say that. Uh, um, there is a place in, in, in close to our world called Indore Valley. So, uh, so dating of uh, the settlement, they say that uh, uh, around 12th century AD, there was a rapid transformative phase of urbanization. Uh, there were the, some forts, they were constructed. And, uh, um, and then uh, the, uh, we also found that uh, there are some blazes uh, in the late 14th and 15th centuries, they were associated with the with the politics of uh, you know uh, of, of, of Mewat region. So this kind of uh, this is one of the study which we did. There is another studies where we found that uh, there were the uh, in the Ladakh area, the earliest uh, around uh, 7,700 BC, there are the settlement of human habitation in the Nubra Valley. So this is, you know, these are the studies which have been done. There is one study which we took up uh, from the dating of ancient mines um, in Udaipur, close to Udaipur. There are the uh, there are a lot of mines which uh, where the zinc, lead, and silver is mined. Uh, the ore is, uh, you know, excavated from these areas and uh, and then it's uh, purified and sold. So there were a lot of charcoal and wood. Uh, we received from this area and then uh, this was dated and we found that these uh, charcoal and wood were having a date of 400 to 700 BC when the world was learning how to live we were doing the excavation of these ores and uh, uh, this was an attempt to dig out the glorious past of India's metallurgy metal knowledge so uh, you know, such kind of work. And then uh, I would uh, move towards the uh, geology, where uh, in Andaman areas, uh, we recorded uh, or we recorded the, all the events of the tsunami events basically happened in the last 8,000 years. 
and uh, due to earthquakes, in fact, and uh, we found that there was a recurrence, there was a you know pattern in these earthquakes, a recurrence of having a, a you know uh, uh, time difference of around four, ranging from 420 to 750 years. There was sort of, uh, the big earthquakes of of uh, uh, you know higher intensity. Uh, having a, a gap of 420 to 750 years and shorter, uh, uh, there were uh, some you know large magnetic earthquakes having a shorter interval also. So this work is published in scientific reports in Nature, where uh, you know uh, and highly cited in fact. And then uh, there were some earthquakes which has happened in Nepal Himalaya. They were also dated, and uh, the conclusion of this study was that. Uh, an earthquake of similar size of around 8.5 uh, HRE scale is expected in uh, part of Himalayas because uh, the, of the periodicity of around 700 years. There has been no earthquake from last 700 years, and this is what is you know uh, uh, expected that there may be a very large earthquake of this uh, uh, intensity. So this, these all these studies are done utilizing radiocarbon dating at IUC. There were a lot of other studies, which time is not permitting for me to say, but there are a lot of studies about the monsoonal activities, paleo mounts, monsoon, and uh, paleo climate, how was the climate, glacial retreat, and uh, a lot of studies are being done. And one study, in fact, we also did in the, in, in the direction of drug discovery, um, uh, with the, in collaboration with Glenmark, is a company which made make a lot of medicines, and uh, the the finding of okay the purpose of doing this was that you know there are a lot of uh, medicines which uh, people claim that they are of herbal origin, which actually sometimes they are not. Uh, they are made from the uh, fossil fuel. Um, uh, I mean petroleum uh, products out of petroleum products. And the, by looking at the uh, structure of the molecules, uh, you cannot identify it whether this is uh, fossil fuel derived or natural animal source. So, using 14 carbon dating, we can find out we can if it is synthetic or if it is fossil fuel derived. There will be no 14 carbon because fossil fuel age of fossil fuel is more than 50,000 years, which is the which is the limit of 14 carbon clock. While in case of natural uh, products, you will find the 14 carbon, which is because 14 carbon is always found in the environment by, by the action of cosmic rays. So this work was also done. And uh, so there are a lot of application of radiocarbon dating and uh, beryllium aluminum 10 dating also, aluminum 10 dating also, which have been you know, performed. And uh, now the last part of my talk, in fact, um, that in uh, 2015, um, Ministry of Earth Sciences, um, they gave uh, uh, a generous funding uh, to IUSC to develop a facility, national facility, uh, which can have all the modern instrumentation uh, utilizing uh, uh, utilizing them, those instruments, and one can do the chronology of different time scale because radio carbon dating is limited up to last five, 50 years, and there are a lot of other things. Uh, which um, you know geologists want to date. For example, let's say the rock when the rock was found, when the earth was found. How? What are the temperature and pressure when the earth was found? All these studies, in fact, can be done with the instrumentation available now with the and under the geochronology facility. So the objective of uh, this geochronology facility was that we can, you know, matching with the mandate of IUSC. We can develop an internationally competitive facility which can permit or which can provide the uh, measurement of quality isotopic data and uh, which can also uh, also do characterization of different geological instruments and utilizing the instrument one can perform the research in in the areas of climate change past climate uh, carbon cycle global carbon cycle oceanographic parameters uh, um, uh, polar and Antarctica Arctic research programs, of course, archaeology, which of course we are doing, but some characterization, 
phytomedicine also. And in addition to this, to develop the capacity where the PhDs uh, can be trained. Uh, so this was the purpose of this uh, facility. Sorry, there is some issue. Thank you, Pangaj Kumar, uh, for giving uh, your introduction. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you have let something me, else? Yeah, something else also there, yeah. So uh, this uh, geochronology facility, there were two major components. One was the accelerator for uh, medium and heavy mass radioisotopes, and then HR SIMS, high resolution secondary air mass photometer, plus many other instruments. So I am happy to know, uh, say that all these instruments are, uh, and most of these instruments have been procured. We have uh, world class XRD, XRF, SEM, and uh, ICPMS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, and also which is coupled with the femtosecond laser. This is the first of its type in our country for, for, for geological research. Um, and all these things are there, in fact, and uh, the ICPMS can be utilized for, uh, you know, for measuring the elemental analysis or doing the elemental analysis in water, sediment, aerosol, and quartz samples. And uh, with the laser, uh, you can do the zircon dating, uh, which where, you know, you can find out the the earth formation processes and this is magnetic barrier separation where you can separate the different minerals based on their magnetic property these are the some small small equipments for crushing the samples and sieving the samples and converting the sample in required sample size so this is in fact uh, the the first ever large geometry uh, high resolution secondary and mass spectrometer in our country and uh, this is uh, uh, you know, uh, this will be highly utilized by geologists to perform uranium lead geochronology uh, and also to study the um, various stable isotopes um, for knowing the temperature, pressure, uh, and many other geochemical uh, factors during the formation of um, you know, earth or formation of uh, different ro or rocks in different part of Country. This is the picture of this um, uh, HR SIMS installed in, in our, in, in our uh, center. And this is the recent, in fact, recent addition to IUSC um, in, in, in March, in February, uh, March only, it was installed. And uh, it, is, it, has, it, it has very, you know, high, um, I should say, uh, state of art uh, features. Can which will be highly useful for the geological purpose, and it can do a zircon dating, and it can uh, you know map the zircon. Not only in you know not only in uh, geology, it can also be utilized in material sciences, where where uh, a lot of isotopic studies can be done. Trace elements can be utilized. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Holda. Yeah, thank you, Pankaj, for uh, an interesting presentation. And you have uh, covered almost all the areas of uh, geochronology facilities, our center, and accelerators also. And I have a request to the participants that uh, we will be taking the questions and other uh, discussions through chat, and it will be addressed at a later time because of the short of time that we have here. So once again, I thank Dr. Pankaj Kumar for this uh, presentation. Thank you, Golda. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, myself, Saif Ahmed Khan. Can you hear me? Yeah, you we can hear you, Saif, but we cannot okay. see you. Actually, I still have that camera problem. <clears throat> OK. No. OK. So uh, Pankaj, you have covered um, all the accelerators and the facilities and this uh, overview was very nice so now let us hear from golda she is oh, in i did not take much time i, I did not took much time huh? uh, no no perfect <laughs> okay now let us hear from golda she is in iusc for over around, around two decades in this period she has actively contributed to the development and maintenance of various uh, nuclear physics facilities 
at IUSC. And uh, I can say NAND and GPSC are the major ones. So apart from this, she has uh, contributed to the user experiment and helped them in data analysis. And uh, she's interested in nuclear reactions. So today she will be talking about nuclear physics research uh, programs uh, at Coulomb Barrier Energies using IUSC facilities. So uh, let us hear from Golda now. Yeah. Golda, there thank is you, a safe. Yeah, thank you, Safe. Uh, uh, this is uh, my slides are visible. Yeah, but there yes. is a yes. there are there is one you know rectangle box which you probably have to minimize or remove it from. Yeah, this one, yes. Is it fine now? Yeah, this is fine. Oh, please do the uh, full screen. Yeah, it is in full screen already. Fine. Okay. Good morning, all of you. So I will be talking about the nuclear physics research at uh, Coulomb Barrier Energies using IUSC facilities. So I will be mainly focusing on the uh, experimental facilities that we have at IUSC for doing a research in nuclear reactions and spectroscopy. Uh, I will also give a, a brief uh, a discussion about the uh, type of activities that we carry out with the facilities that we have at IUSC, along with the collaboration of different university people. So uh, first of all, let us see why why do we need to study nuclear physics? For us, uh, all of us know that actually the study of nuclear physics gives us idea about the uh, evolution of the uh, universe, as well as it also gives us idea about the structure of the nuclei and other properties of the nuclei. Even though the nuclei has been discovered in the early uh, years of last century, many properties of the nuclei are still unknown and many uh, interactions between nuclei are also unknown. So if you look at the nuclear landscape, many of the elements are available in nature, but many are not. So the study of nuclear physics actually helps us to understand more about the unstable nuclei, which are otherwise not available in nature, and some of the unstable nuclei may be available, but they are quite unstable that it will not stay for a longer time. And if you look at the international scenario of nuclear physics currently, so you can uh, see that the synthesis of super heavy elements is the main focus of almost all the labs around the globe. What are these super heavy elements? super heavy elements are those which are always not available in nature and which can be formed in laboratory. That means these are synthesized elements. This can be produced in uh, using accelerators and their properties can also be studied using accelerators and associated facilities. So one can briefly say that the main focus of the nuclear physics research of the entire world is more focused towards the synthesis and studies of super heavy elements. But it is not always true that we are confining ours to only to super heavy elements. If you just look at it in a broader way, the energy regimes of nuclear uh, interactions can be classified mainly into three different regions. One is low energy regime, where the energy is 10, uh, is less than 10 MeV per nucleon. Here, the studies in nuclear physics gives us information about the properties of nuclei as a whole. And in this region, the reactions are primarily dominated by nuclear mean field. And in the intermediate energy region, where we can say that the energy is somewhere between about 20 MeV per nucleon to 1 GeV per nucleon, here, both the mean field and NN interaction collisions are important. The composite bound system breaks into nucleotides and intermediate multifragments. And 
Other possibilities in these regions are multifragmentation, liquid gas phase transitions, etc. So if you go higher up in energy, if you go to relativistic energy region, where the energy is more than 1 GeV per nucleon, there mainly individual NN collision play a major role. And structure of the hard roads can also be studied in this energy region. Along with that, the formation of QGP at ultra relativistic energy is one of the main focus at very high energies. Other than this, we do experiments to understand the uh, universe that also is involved, like uh, that there the energy region will be somewhat lower. So considering this, you can see that as uh, Dr. Pan Pankaj Kumar has already shown, our energy region, the uh, energy which is accessible with our ac particle accelerators at Indore University Accelerator Center is limited with the lower energy section. For this, uh, he has also shown this figure where this red curve actually shows the Coulomb barrier for a symmetric collision. That means if A is uh, a new nuclei of mass A is colliding another one of A, then the Coulomb barrier is like this. So since the properties of nuclei can be studied only when the energies are near the barrier, so it is important to have uh, the energies in the region to have an understanding about the nuclear properties. So with the peloton, we can have an energy in this uh region as it was shown by pankaj kumar that blue region gives the uh electron energy with a solid stripper and the purple one gives that with a gas stripper so you can see that if we can go maximum up to about 50, uh, 60 atomic mass unit for having a, a nuclear reaction where we can cross the barrier for a symmetric interaction. But most of the region of nu nuclear charge is untouchable in that scenario. That is the re re reason why we went for a, a linear accelerator where we can boost the energy of the beam that is delivered by the pelotron and we can actually go up to about 100 mass units. So further, this can be boosted by the incorporation of the high current uh, injector, which is under development at IUS. Thus, we will be comfortably able to go to reactions uh, very close to one about 130 mass unit. That means, actually, if you are not actually looking at very symmetric interaction, if you are looking at an asymmetric interaction, we can go very near to super heavy region. Of course, we are not able to go to super heavy region, but very near to that in high actinate region, we can study the properties and interaction using other associated facilities at IUAC. So what are the facilities that we have at IUAC for nuclear reaction as well as structure studies? For reaction dynamic studies, we have a heavy even in a reaction analyzer Hira in beam hall one, we have one more uh, recoil mass separator that is hybrid recoil mass separator in beam hall two, and a large scattering chamber known as general purpose scattering chamber GPSC in beam hall one, and national array of neutron detectors in beam hall two, and for structure studies we have a gamma detector array in beam hall one, and a uh, collaborative work of uh, all the institutes within the country, that is a uh, Indian National Gamma Array in Beam Hall 2. So, electron beam is delivered in Beam Hall 1, and the boosted energy, uh, boosted uh, beam, the boosting is done by LINAC, that, that is delivered in Beam Hall 2. And in addition to all these major facilities, there are many other uh, add-ons to this, like we have charged particle detector arrays and uh, high, high graphs, 
these are some add-ons to the this major uh, nuclear physics facilities so they actually help us to understand in detail and in depth about the nuclear reactions and nuclear structure in addition to that the support laboratories like target development lab and vacuum lab and electronics lab and computational facilities actually boost our research work in this field it is actually very much important to have a very good computing facility to understand the nature of uh, nucleus for uh, the facilities that we have at iusc is being used by many users including faculties and students from different universities and institutes all over the country so if we look at the low energy collision between two nuclei what are the reactions possible so we are talking about an energy region slightly below to slightly above the coulomb barrier so below the coulomb barrier there can be some elastic scattering in elastic scattering like that so this actually gives us the an idea how the impact parameter or in an another way the energy defines the possible reaction channels so depending on the impact parameter you can have different processes elastic scattering or in elastic scattering and deep in elastic scattering and fusion reactions and be the facilities at iusc is addressing all these phases of nuclear interaction so for example here you can see that the fusion reactions can be studied using hira and hira and the transfer reactions can be studied using the hira and gpsc facilities elastic and inelastic scattering can be studied using gpsc and fission can be studied using the gpsc and nano facilities and incomplete fusion reactions can also be studied using gpsc so once this colliding system nuclei overcome the coulomb barrier they form a dinuclear system which is very hot and this dinuclear system evolves it equilibrates to form a compound nucleus so in this process it goes through different pathway so with the uh, facilities that we have at iusc along with the, some specific instruments and the very uh, enriched and uh, detecting system we can take snapshots of each stage of this interaction so after the collision the nuclei can actually uh, form the two nuclei are colliding each other once they overcome the coulomb barrier they form a dinuclear system this dinuclear system either can go to a uh, fast fission without forming a compound nucleus or with time it can form a compound nucleus and this compound nucleus that will emit some particles so at different stages we can have snapshots uh, of what is happening there by using the uh, large detector arrays that we have at iusc so the facilities can also be used to study the reaction mechanism the study of reaction mechanism gives us idea about the reaction cross sections that means the probability of probability of the reaction the time scales of the reactions the de excitation cascade what are the channels through which it de excites and the entrance channel effects and uh, the structural study gives us information of the energy levels spin parity and shape of different nuclei so uh, here as it is shown in the previous slide with the pelletron energy that if when you uh, put a beam uh, a continuous beam or even we can have a pulse beam also beam on a target material after fusion they can go to uh, fast fission that is one pathway so we if it is going to have fast fission the fission frag fragments can be studied using the general purpose scattering chamber and if it is going to a compound nucleus formation the hot nuclei will de excite by emitting neutrons or protons like charged uh, light charged particles and neutral particles 
Well, they can be captured by using the charge particle detector array and neutron, uh, neutron array. And further, the uh, carbon system de excites through the emission of gamma rays. This region can be studied using uh, gamma detector arrays at AUSC. And finally, the residual nuclei which is formed in the ground state can be studied using the uh, two different uh, recoil mass separators that we have at IUS. For what are our major physics programs? For depending on the energy availability and the experimental facilities that we have at IUSC, our uh, areas of research in the recent years can be uh, categorized into these three sec uh, different sections. For first of all, first and one of the major interest of our center is to study the statistical decay of excited compound nuclei by measuring the evaporation residues, fission fragments, if it is going through a friction channel, and then the evaporated right charge particles like neutrons, protons, alphas, etc., and then gamma ray multiplicity, and then dipole resonance gamma rays. And we can also study the effects of neutron shell closure, especially Z is equal to 82 and N is equal to 126. That is the region which is accessible with uh, the facilities here for different observables. The shell effect can be reflected in the ER cross-section or in the neutron multiplicity, even the mass distribution or angular distribution of the fission fragments. The qualitative and quantitative understanding of non compound fission events, that means the cause of fission, which is actually a, a factor which is hindering the formation of super heavy elements, and pre equilibrium fission mechanism can be studied using fission fragment mass and angular distributions. Total kinetic energy distribution can also be used for such studies. The competition between complete and incomplete fusion can also be studied using our facilities here. Incomplete study, uh, inc incomplete fusion means the incoming particle, the projectile is partially fusing with the uh, target nuclei. The remaining part of the projectile is singly, simply flying away. Many other possibilities also exist and which can be accomplished by close cl collaboration between IUAC and user community. And we expect that uh, from this kind of accountants program, we get more users and then we can explore different areas in nuclear physics in a collaborative manner. So now I will go move on to different uh, facilities that we have. I'll just uh, describe its features. So, this is all of the facilities uh, that is used for nuclear reaction studies, general purpose scattering chamber, which is presently installed in 30 degree beam blind. So it is an ex extensively used facility of IUSC. It, this facility is not only used for nuclear physics reactions, it is also used for material science as well as atomic physics, physics uh, research activities. This uh, Particular facility was installed in uh, 45 degree beam line of uh, IU, uh, beam fault one of IU. Installation of high current injector. This facility has been recently moved to 30 degree beam line. And even though this chamber is about uh, 30 year old, this is still retained because of the versatility of this uh, chamber. In this facility for their research activities. This is an 1.5 meter diameter scattering chamber which is equipped with the rotating arms where we can mount the detectors and the, these detectors can be mounted at different uh, distances as well as this can be remotely uh, rotated. So this facility actually gives us freedom to study angular uh, distribution and uh, Mm. other uh, transfer induced uh, transfer related uh, reactions in nuclear reaction studies and this also has a facility for in vacuum 
target transfer that means without breaking the vacuum of the chamber you can change the uh, target or uh, we can save time and in a go we can actually if it is an irradiation experiment we can irradiate a number of samples without breaking the vacuum inside the chamber so these facilities are very much used for the studies of uh, incomplete fusion uh, and the pre equilibrium uh, reactions because this kind of facility is very much useful for uh, the recoil range uh, distribution studies and the research programs that we can actually address with gpsr light particle emission in fusion reactions we can study the energy distribution as well as the angular distribution of light particles neutrons protons and alpha emitted in fusion reactions and fusion cross section measurements can also be studied we have recently done an experiment to catch the evaporation residues in the forward direction using uh, opposition sensitivity M uh, mwpcs and the study of in elastic scattering in microscopic formalism can also be addressed using this facility dynamical and endothermal effects in fusion reaction can be studied using neutron multiplicity measurement and heavy ion induced fission angular distribution mass distribution as well as total kinetic energy distribution has also been studied using these facilities at near and sub coulomb barrier anomalous fusion fission reactions of deformed actinide targets are also studied using this facility in near coulomb barrier energies in, as it was mentioned complete and incomplete fusion studies it is very extensively done using the uh, in vacuum trans, uh, target transfer facility in uh, of I, uh, gpsc for so i'll i'll just flash some of the results from this facility for so this is a fission fragment angular distribution measurement where where we have a number of detectors we can actually uh, have a, a total of 13 detectors at a time these are hybrid detectors that means it has a gas uh, followed by a a solid state detector it can be used to get the angular distribution this detector system can be used to get the angular distribution of fission fragments as well as cosy elastic this particular study which i am showing here it is actually used for the fission fragment uh, angular distribution studies four detectors are placed at different angles we have a accurate angular information about this detectors from the energy loss and total energy information we can clearly separate out the fission fragments from other channels this infected in this particular uh, information can also be used to get the cosy elastic uh, cross section for so this is one of our uh, the thesis one of the thesis work of one of our student from iusc for so the fission angular distribution as it is plotted here can be integrated to get uh, uh, the fission cross section and as well as the anisotropy anisotropy of fission angular distribution means the ratio of the cross section at 0 degree to the ratio uh, uh, of the cross section at uh, 90 degree in the center of mass this actually gives helps us to understand the uh, occurrence of other channels other than the combo nuclear reactions at near barrier energies for well, it has been noted that the occurrence of other channels like uh, fast fission or cosy fission enhances the anisotropy uh, at near barrier energy and moreover this kind of uh, total cross section the measurements can also help us to improve the uh, statistical model theory that already exists uh, another study is using the fission fragment mass distribution it, this is a, this is also a study carried by our student at iusc so it has been observed that there is an enhancement in the mass variance variance of the mass distribution of the fission fragments at below barrier energy if you see here to go below barrier there is an enhancement in the mass distribution this actually was earlier uh, thought that it is because of the occurrence of cosy fission or pre equilibrium but from this particular study it is almost like uh, uh, well understood that it is not just because of cosy fission it is because of the interplay of different modes of fission like of symmetric and asymmetric uh, fission 
can happen at this energies and the combination of these two give rise to a broadened mass distribution or even it can sometimes give a flat of mass distribution for two more features of fission arises due to the shell effects changing the landscape of the potential energy surface at low excitation energy for this particular study it has studied uh, 225 and 227 pa at uh, excitation energy in the range of 30 to 50 mev so in this mass uh, excitation energy 30 to 50 mev the shell effect still has a role to play for the uh, because of this shell effects uh, the fission fragment might prefer a asymmetric channel however when uh, the coponuclear formation happens it uh, prefers a symmetric fission the combination of these two a uh, weighted combination in fact that will lead to a broadened mass distribution so this is our another interesting uh, phenomena that it has been recently observed that there is an asymmetric fission um, uh, seen in the mass region thorium also so in uh, using the iuc facilities we have also explored uh, the thorium nuclei uh, 226 thorium using this reaction dating oxygen on 208 lead at different excitation energies and it has uh, shown us that at lower excitation energy the mass distribution broadens that means it has a two it has two shoulders at the lower and higher mass region that means there is a mixing of symmetric and asymmetric mass for another major uh, facility that we have for uh, nuclear reaction studies is heavy even reaction analyzer in being called one this is one of the very few uh, rms existing in the world now and then uh, if you see that this particular uh, rms if, if you see the optical analog of this uh, hira it looks like this for so this facility is used for ear measurement another rms facility that we have is uh, the Hira, which is uh, installed in beam hall 2 this Hira actually the the main uh, activities using Hira is fusion fusion dynamics in heavy mass region so of course we will not be able to go to higher actinides uh, we can comfortably do the studies in uh, near mass 200 region using these facilities and entrance channel effects in formation and decay of heavy nuclei, fission hindrance by ear cross section and spin distribution measurement. The spin spectrometer, which is uh, uh, coupled to HIDA, gives us uh, uh, can be used for the spin distribution measurements and ear tag gamma spectroscopy of translate nuclei. The detectors in the Gamma detector arrays of IUSC has been coupled to HIRA for this purpose. And uh, this was a very uh, extensive work carried out by different universities and institutes of, within the country. And many purposes have come out of this particular work. Or then uh, we can also study N is equal to Z nuclei up to A is equal to 120. For the hybrid, Recoil mass uh, analyzer. This has dual mode, so it can have uh, it cannot be operated in gas field mode as well as in vacuum mode. The gas field mode it can be used for mass less than uh, 200, and it has a normal kinematics, the good collection efficiency, the velocity and charge state focusing is very good in this uh, mode of operation, and Z and A identification is also very good and this can be actually used for decay tagging also and in vacuum mode n is equal to z uh, less than 100 atomic mass units here it is inverse kinematics good primary beam rejection in two stages as uh, and then z and a identification using x delta e and e detecting this is the detector receptor that will be used at the focus plane so here is a combination of gas field separator and recoil mass separator. So this is one of the very few facilities existing in the world because 
uh, the hybrid uh, recoil analysis are not very um, many in the other laboratories and these two rms facilities are the only two that we have within the country so these are some of the result from uh, kira so you can have the time of flight and the energy information energy loss information of the uh, recoil at the focal plane of the rms for this clearly separate like this is the beam like particles and these are the recoil uh, uh, the evaporation residues so they are very uh, clearly separated in this 2d contour plots so it can be used to study uh, the fusion uh, reactions by measuring the er cross section so you can see that as we go uh, lower and lower in the energy the er formation probability is very low so what that uh, we have a limit in this uh, process like if you go further down um, they cannot make out what is background and the real events so see, as you can see here we can go very much lower in the um the column, below the coulomb barrier and this kind of studies actually enriches our knowledge about the nuclear nuclear collision and this facility was also used for the production of uh, radio ion beam in india seven lithium was produced using hira this was the first ever produced uh, radio ion beam in india and it was produced in the energy range of uh, 17 to 22 mev using the uh, reaction uh, uh, lithium pn reactions and in inverse kinematics that its lithium beam was used on proton target and the uh, hira is used as a filter so this is the reaction chamber and you get the beam at the focal plane of the uh, hira for the energy spread that we obtained is uh, plus minus uh, 0.5 mev very it is very good uh, in terms of uh, radioactive ion beam and the purity of the beam was uh, more than 99% and the beam intensity was uh, 10 to the power 4 particles per second and this is another work where the air measurement was done the air excitation function for oxygen plus 194 platinum at 210 radon was carried out and the the data the measured data was reproduced by a dns model and this was part of one of the student from uh, central university of uh, kerala and in this particular uh, study he has carried out the measurement for three different system to, to understand the role of uh, entrance channel in the formation of compound nuclei uh, according to bohr's hypothesis uh, once the compound nuclei is formed it forgets the uh, entrance channel that means irrespective of the entrance channel the compound nuclei behaves in the same way however the recent experiment shows that it is not true depending on the uh, mass entrance channel mass asymmetry and the shell uh, structure of the uh, 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 nuclei of uh, partners in the reactions the uh, nature of the evaporation residue is different and even the formation probability is also different as you can see clearly here for a very asymmetric reaction the formation probability is very high and as you go uh, higher and higher in the mass of the projectile that means when you are going towards more a symmetric system the formation probability is going down therefore to understand uh, this kind of phenomena a normal statistical model will not be sufficient and involved a dynamical model is necessary to interpret such data for the measurement in this uh, Mm, in this type of measurements actually help us to understand the reaction process more clearly and it also helps up to improve the theoretical model that is existing and another major facility that we have at uh, iuc is national array of neutron detectors this facility has 100 
5 inch dia by 5 inch thick neutron detectors around the target chamber and this this is the scatter reaction chamber this is one one meter dia reacting uh, chamber having a thickness of 4 mm ss and in this reaction chamber you can place the target and charge particle detectors mainly uh, the fission detectors light charge particle detectors which are, which can be cesium iodide silicon detectors etc so the these neutron detectors are placed at 1.75 meter from the target which gives us a sufficient flight path to get a time of flight information from where the energy of the neutrons are estimated for so another high granularity of this detector array gives us uh, a privilege to understand the average neutron multiplicity as well as the distribution of the neutron multiplicity in one of any of the nuclear reactions and the structure the physical structure of this is based on a geodesic dome which gives the enough strength and you can see that the material surrounding the scattering chamber is minimized using this particular structure so what are the physics that can be addressed using this large facilities so you can study the time scale actually when a dinuclear system forms it is always hot and it is unstable because of that it actually emits uh, neutrons for neutron being neutral particles it doesn't have to overcome the coulomb barrier for the number of neutron emitted actually gives us information about the time that is why neutron is actually uh, used as a clock as well as a thermometer to study nuclear reactions because the energy distribution actually gives us information about the temperature of the uh, hot system and therefore this uh, array of these neutron detectors is used for the time scale and dynamics associated with fusion fission and this is also used for the neutron multiplicity distribution measurements and formation and understanding of unstable stable nuclei, study of nuclear viscosity, along with complete and incomplete fusion reactions and weakly bound neutron halo nuclei. So this is a schematic of it, as I explained earlier. Inside this chamber, we have a fusion detector, and we can have the uh, target as well as other charged particle can also be accommodated. Since these neutron detectors are sensitive to gamma rays also, the remaining beam, the only a small part of the beam will be interacting with the target nuclear. The remaining beam is dumped far off from the neutron detectors in a dedicated beam dump, which is covered by porated paraffin and lead block. And this is one of the results that we got from our uh, neutron detector array for the uh, energy distribution of the neutrons emitted in carbon on platinum system was measured at different angles and from that you can extract the precision neutron multiplicity along with position uh, neutron multiplicity and temperature of the fissioning nuclei for so this information can be uh, combined with other measurements like uh, evaporation uh, residue measurement and fission fragment uh, cross-section to get an uh, understanding of the system. For so this particular study was carried out to uh, understand the role of shell closure in defining the fate of a copper nuclear. So here two systems were studied where uh, one system formed uh, a compound system where the neutron number was 126 and the, in the other case it was 122. Before the compare, comparing these uh, two measurements, we could understand that actually shell uh, effect has a role to play in defining the path of the compound nuclei. So similarly, the entrance channel effect and uh, nuclear dissipation was also studied in 204 by uh, Benaras Hindu University. So they have used a 16 oxygen beam on, on 86 tungsten at different excitation energies. 
therefore it can be seen that the uh, viscosity that which actually influences the reaction mechanism is different for different uh, uh, region because here the is at p and is at t that means that that is the product of the charges of projectile and target for as we go higher in that the dissipation strength is small this is the fitted value using the uh, statistical model code similarly it also the dissipation strength also depends on the mass asymmetry mass asymmetry means the uh, it is actually if you uh, it can be defined as the difference in the mass of the projectile and target uh, divided by the total mass of the compound system so, this has an important role to play uh, because with respect to businaro galon mass asymmetry businaro galon mass asymmetry is the critical mass asymmetry for a, any particular uh, facility the potential energy of the system will be high at one particular mass asymmetry so if the system entrance channel is below that critical mass asymmetry or not that has a major role in uh, determining the fate of the compound nuclei which is formed whether it will go to a um, completely equilibrated system or it will split into two fragments before equilibration so and moreover this particular information is very useful because the in the formation of super heavy elements the occurrence of quasi fission or fast fission is giving a hindrance like if uh, the probability of the super heavy formation is reduced by this factor so for understanding in detail about the occurrence of quasi fission is very much important and nuclear dissipation at very high excitation energy for uh, near uh, super heavy elements have also been studied using neutron array facility at iuc so here the new, uh, precision neutron multiplicity values are analyzed using statistical model code and this also uh, gives us how the temperature uh, depends on the uh, reaction process so this is also very much important because at what energy the reaction uh, has to be planned uh, that can be predicted by using the theoretical models if we have in depth understanding about the excitation uh, energy dependence on the uh, reaction probability and we have two major facilities for the uh, spectroscopy studies one is gamma detector array which is installed in the beam fault one of uh, iusc which also has a charge particle detector array comparable to that and it also has one g factor measurement setup and plunger setup along with that this has high purity germanium detectors more features are discussed here this has 12 spg detectors placed coaxially in the anti comet shields and they are placed at uh, different angles say 14 5 99 and 150 uh, degree with respect to the beam in two horizontal angles at 20 plus minus 25 degree to the horizontal plane and it have 14 bgo detectors seven above and seven below the scattering chamber in a honeycomb structure and this total structure actually covers 35 percentage of total solid angle at of, at the target and they, uh, this can be used for energy uh, and uh, multiplicity filter and another major facility that we have at iuac is indian national gamma array it can accommodate total of 24 flower uh, germanium detectors these detectors are uh, pulled from different universities and institutes within the country so this is a very big collaborative work initiated in the oh, early uh, years of to, uh, this century and it has evolved with time for so now even uh, in the present scenario we have 16 flower detectors at our center for so the major features of this uh, facility is that it can it has uh, content suppressed flower uh, flower detectors with about nearly 4 pi geometrical coverage individual sheet suspend an angle of 30 degree at the target maximum of 24 flower detectors as i mentioned can be accommodated in that array 
but it varies depending on the availability the detectors use uh, varies from tall to 18 at a time and Total photopic efficiency of this array is 5%, which, which actually is one of the best uh, five arrays in the world. And the array is optimized for triple gamma coincidence measurements and higher fold measurements. The dedicated data acquisition system and uh, signal processing electronics developed in house actually enables us to have a optimum collection of data and analysis of the data. So this uh, INGA facility can also be used with uh, accelerated detectors like system iodide based charge particle detector array, which gives us uh, the facility to tag charge particles and see some very rare channels in the gamma ray spectroscopy. This facility INGA is also coupled with HIDA, where we can actually tag the evaporation residue. The, the, that way it actually gives us uh, gives us uh, an opportunity to tag very rare nuclei which are formed uh, in, in the middle of a um, very uh, cloudy environment. You can say like uh, for fission fragments, the number of uh, part, uh, nuclei will be very high. However, if you want to study in, uh, in such scenario, the tagging using HIDA will be more use useful. So if, if there can be some uh, cases where the uh, reaction actually gives a lot of uh, fission um, fragments, however, we will be interested in some uh, particular compound nuclei which is formed. In that kind of scenario, uh, this tagging with a recoil mass separator is very much useful. So uh, this EDA as well as uh, INGA can be used for the study of <coughs> sorry, spectroscopy of light nuclei in different region. And we can go to uh, the neutron and proton drip line. <coughs> and with the availability of INGA in beam uh, two, we can go to uh, actinide region. The super deformation in light actinide spectroscopy of the second well in this stage and structure and stability for searching heaviest nuclei and octopole correlations. <coughs> then we can go to higher spins also. So, uh, for P of shell nuclei, uh, we can go to proton drip line, interplay of single particle and collective excitation and study of pairing in the nuclei, then accurate measurement of lifetime and key factors with the uh, accelerated facility, facilities available with the uh, gamma detector arrays. And a detailed comparison with large basic shell model is possible. And with the, our uh, high profile computing system, the shell model calculations can be carried out and we have a co collaborative program with the Kashmir University for this kind of work. And therefore, uh, not only the experimental work, the, the theoretical work can also be carried out at IUC uh, using the, our high private computing system. And then exotic shapes of uh, some rare nuclei can also be studied and then uh, there is a program for study the new symmetries in the nuclei in different mass regions. The nuclear symmetry is possible in different mass regions, and we have dedicated program for that. So this is one of the example where the gamma day decay for from a uh, heavy system to fifty two, you know, can be studied using in the facilities using uh, this many. Uh, Flower detector since the gamma efficiency is very high for flower detectors compared to single SPTE detectors. Almost I am coming to the end of the talk. So with the, all these facilities which uh, we have discussed, uh, 
which are used for nuclear reaction as well as spectroscopy studies, we still have many areas to explore. So let us look at the future for prospectives that what can be done in future with the facilities at IUC. So we, we have uh, the LINAC uh, in um, functional, like all the cavities of the LINACs are now working. So we can have, have the maximum energy boosting from LINAC. So along with that, uh, we can, uh, we, we are having the high uh, intensity beam with the upcoming high current injector. So that will give us a chance to study different beams, <coughs> using different beams, and then we can go to different mass regions. So in that way, we are better off now. So we can go to different mass regions as well as in the energy to explore new physics with the collaboration with the university faculty. For the, these are the few of the fields which can be explored. The chance vision has studies has not yet been done, but it is possible with the facilities and the upcoming uh, new beams in, at IUSC. And survival probability of new, uh, so near super heavy region, uh, we have started with that pro uh, uh, project, but there are still many uh, nuclei to be explored. And mass gated neutral multiplicities is another possibility that is still not explored to the full uh, strength with the facilities that we have at IUSC. So, with a high current injector, hopefully, we'll get very high uh, intense beam and we can go to high uh, higher mass region with good uh, yield so that the number of beam uh, beam time consumption will not be a problem so similarly the light particle multiplicity distribution is another uh, area where we can still have scope to explore and of course with the uh, inga along with hyda gives us a uh, better hand to explore the structure of actinides at higher spin and high excitation energy. So with this, I conclude. Thank you very much. And I would like to acknowledge the members of Accelerator Group, Data Acquisitions Group, Target Lab, and Mechanical Workshop, Vacuum Lab of IUSC, along with the collaboration from universities like Punjabi University, Banaras Hindu University, Central University of Kerala, Delhi University, and other institutes like BECC Kolkata, SINB Kolkata, and BARC Mumbai. Thank you. Thank you, Golda, for uh, this nice summary. And it is actually difficult to cover all the research programs in details. So, but I'm sure that uh, the participants got glimpse of it and uh, will interact with the concerned people in Golda herself and uh, learn about more learn more about the program and uh, carry on research that i will see so golda when shall we meet again yeah now we will have a break a short break for uh, tea can we continue madam because uh, then it will be difficult for others to get connected okay if you feel so and uh, safe, if, are you ready? Uh, I can you want join to in two break? minutes, two, five minutes break. For okay, okay. I'll uh, have some water. What, what probably we can do, we can keep connected and okay. then uh, take, take tea or whatever. Discuss. Keep connected. I mean, do not. Okay. Meanwhile, you can ask. Here. Yeah. Meanwhile, we can take up some questions if people want. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, Pangaj? Pangaj? Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can sh uh, show the slides that you have about the, our okay. other activities. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, along with the uh, normal activities of uh, use, so the usage of iron accelerators at IUAC, we also offer uh, many other activities to university users including faculties and uh, research scholars so we will just flash some of our activities in that region
So, uh, is it, uh, can you see that? Golda, is it okay? Is it Benjamin? Visible. Okay. So this is actually you see that um, user uh, distribution map uh, from country from all the corners of country we have the users and uh, during different years this is in fact the graphical representation of 2016 only but beyond that also you see the the, uh, the increase uh, in number of users originating from uh, universities colleges and institutes so. Uh, IUSC is basically uh, responsible for uh, operating the accelerators, of course, and then also helping the users in formulating the research programs and uh, then helping the users to conduct their experiments. And uh, as I said that uh, we also are involved into the augmentation of making new accelerators and uh, developing new experimental facilities. In um, IUSC is also conducting PhD programs, uh, PhD t uh, its own uh, uh, research program where uh, students, um, I know they do PhD um, in house and then degree is awarded from JNU. And then we also have PhD teaching program, you know, pre PhD uh, program kind of thing. So every year there are two semesters. And uh, we also have the orientation program for MSc physics students, BSc summer project uh, uh, program, and organization of seminar, conference, workshops, and a Q-tense program like one, the one which we are having right now. So in the in the calendar of events, which is available on our website, every you know every activities which has to happen in a year is listed. Uh, like this one is uh, for 2020 and then uh, of course because of pandemic this year we, many of the you know, activities are uh, taking place online um, but uh, you know uh, you can get an idea after looking at our website that what are the events that take place uh, at IUC and then as I said that in PhD teaching program we have uh, two semesters and altogether there are 10 course modules and then uh, uh, they're divided into five periods uh, for each three week so in semester one uh, there are the uh, you know uh, different topics on material science molecular physics control system and computer thought and in the semester two which is going on right now also uh, there we teach about advanced lectures on experimental uh, and uh, accelerator physics. This is what is going on. Um, you know, we, we students doing PhD in different universities can also apply for these uh, PhD programs, and they are uh, you know giving uh, if they are selected, they are given uh, free TADA as well as boarding, uh, lodging boarding here, and certificate also. And uh, those who want to join as a PhD student or as a postdoc, uh, for PhD, you have to have a uh, uh, GRF conducted by UGC CSIR. And uh, there, are, there is advertisement twice in a year, and then uh, interview takes take place. And these are the areas where people can, a student can register for PhD. As I said, the degrees are awarded from uh, our close by university that is all the universities so those who have already submitted phds or awarded phd they can apply for iusc postdocs along with iusc postdoc we also have uh, you know uh, postdocs or we also host uh, young scientists um, national postdocs inspired fellows and uh, in orientation program uh, you can find out the detail at www.ufc.as.in, our website. But we conduct a two-week MSc orientation program. <clears throat> they are uh, these students who are selected for this purpose. They are associated with one scientist where they get hands-on training on uh, with accelerator-based research. 
and they do a sort project. And uh, for BSc, uh, this is four week long summer program, and they are also chosen. I mean, uh, this highly competitive program. In fact, any student apply for this, and the best ones are chosen, and they are hosted here uh, for four weeks and assigned along with some scientists. And they work on some project where they get experience of different, uh, you know, working uh, on different projects. And uh, they're also given uh, support for travel and as well as lodging and boarding. Equivalence program like what we are doing today that has also been uh, you know, conducted at various places. And uh, interested, whoever is interested, they can write us and then, uh, you know, suitably the place uh, where uh, we have limited number of users or no user, they are chosen and we conduct the rendition program. Now the question comes up that how to apply for beam times. Uh, okay, to avail beam time from Peloton and Delenek, uh, one has to fill online uh, beam time request form. And um, these these forms are uh, you know uh, they are assessed in a um, by a committee called Accelerator Users Committee, and that committee meets twice in a year, and these dates are fixed. Even this year when the pandemic is going on, we did uh, this meeting, uh, although it was online. So the dates are July 5 to 7 and uh, December 16 to 18. Uh, so online form is there. And then uh, the cutoff date for July AUC is May 15th. And for uh, December AUC, it's uh, October 15th. Um, so the, the one of uh, the, the people who are applying for beam time, they present their proposal in front of this committee. And uh, the decision is uh, taken by the uh, Accelerator Users Committee, which comprises the experts from different universities. And the decision is given to the, uh, the person who has applied for the new time. And uh, you know, all these details are also available on, on our website. And uh, so there are different types of um, form, PTR 1, 2, 3, 4. One is uh, where you need just beam time. Two is uh, for the students who have the uh, uh, scholarship from uh, different funding agencies, and they get an account, beam time account, for doing their PhD. And then BTR three is where uh, you get beam time as well as funds, funds basically to give salary to the PhD student or the student who is involved in that project and uh, also some kind of contingency. BTR4 is the one where, uh, um, you know, uh, you have already utilized BTR1 or something and you still want to, you know, continue uh, your research. So that is BTR4. And uh, once the experiment is done uh, here, then um, um, experiment user has to uh, make a presentation based on the preliminary results and also the give they give the feedback and uh, while coming for the uh, experiment uh, users coming from the universities they are supported uh, by TADA and guest house accommodation and uh, we have a cell called academic cell which coordinate all these activities all these informations are available on our website so there are very other than these uh, research labs, there are different labs. Uh, those are supporting the activities which are going on here, like target preparation lab to make the targets uh, for conducting the experiments, detector development lab where the detectors are maintained and developed, vacuum lab which looks after all the vacuum uh, all across the accelerator and beam line electronics lab to develop the data acquisition electronics, magnet lab to take care of uh, magnetic and uh, elect, uh, magnetic uh, you know, equipment all across the beam line and accelerator. There is a health physics lab to uh, take care of the, uh, of the uh, radiation aspect of the users as well as the employees here. Uh, then workshop is also there. And uh, there are various accelerator labs like Peloton and associate development, Linux development, superconducting uh, resonators, uh, fabrication, 
of superconducting resonators cryogenics because we have a superconducting linear accelerator so to take care of the superconductivity part as well as to provide uh, you know the, the the liquid nitrogen and liquid helium we have a uh, you know uh, cryogenics lab as well as many other lab dtl and rfq um, th this may also be interest of the people who are you know uh, from physics uh, background iusc has developed a kit called xpice and that stands for experiments for young engineers and scientists this kit you know um, it can be coupled with any laptop uh, and where uh, different electronics experiments one can do in visual forms you know so detail is again available at our website and there are uh, every year there are two times we conduct workshop uh, on this um, innovative experiments using xpice and uh, in May and October at the time for this. And uh, you know, uh, if everything goes well, probably in October, uh, we can have this workshop in person in IOC. So you can look at our website. This is very good for the you know uh, early career uh, uh, professors at uh, university level who are involved in you know, designing the experiment uh, for physics laboratories, physics students, utilizing this kit one single kit they can perform various different experiments and uh, you know, the, the waveforms and other things are visible on the screen so students can understand in better way yeah i think that's it so now i can request uh, uh, dr Seth if he is ready to yep, okay. I'm ready. yeah make presentation and uh, i will be moderating this session dr Sef, can you Share your uh, slides. Sure. In the meantime, when Dr. Uh, Dr. Saif is sharing a slide, let me introduce Dr. Saif. Uh, Dr. Saif Ahmed Khan, uh, he joined IUC uh, in 2000. So almost 20 years he has completed being in IUC. Is working here as a senior scientist and um, in the material science group. And he is uh, in charge of uh, SEM, uh, scanning electron microscope, ERDA, and RGA facilities and uh, material beam science beam line in, in beam all one. And his research interest lies in nanostructuring, uh, atomistic simulations, and electronic sputtering. Uh, in this lecture, he will be telling us about the ion matter interaction uh, as well as uh, various research programs being done in material science uh, beamline and various other facilities uh, okay. available at IUC. Dr. Saif, please. Thank you, Pankaj, for this introduction. I am sorry to everyone that uh, my camera is not getting on. It is switching for on for only a few seconds and then switches off and says that somebody else is using. I am sure nobody is nobody is hacking my computer, but uh, still it is not getting on. Yesterday also I tried. So for sorry for that. Uh, yeah, although and I'm uh, sure that you are interested in slides and uh, what is the information conveyed. Although you so, cannot see Dr. Sir, but I can tell you that he is very smart <laughs> and good looking. <laughs> Oh my God. And thank you, Pankaj, once again. So, hello, everyone. As Pankaj told you, that in this talk, we'll discuss about uh, how ion matter interaction is being used for material science research. So, in this talk, I'll also tell you about what are the research programs uh, being pursued here and what are the facilities which have been set up at IVSC for uh, this type of work. Okay. So, in the morning session, we saw that Dr. Pankaj told us about uh, various accelerators which are available at IUSC. Uh, from they, they deliver energies from few EVs uh, to a uh, couple of hundred MEVs. Okay, so uh, here you can see all these in pictures. And Pankaj has covered almost everything from this slide. And with these accelerators, uh, people propose some research problems and they carry out research at IVSC. And uh, 
it is very means uh, productive work as you can see that the publications are uh, uh, up to 200 per year recently and uh, many of these publications come from material science research so you may be wondering why iron beam can be used in material science so it can be uh, briefly divided into three uh, one for uh, fabrication second for to modify and characterize material and third one is to study uh, the materials which are going to be used in radiation environment so it is it serves as a laboratory for simulation of these effects so uh, for fabrication you can prepare membranes uh, i will cover i'll be covering these things in the uh, later slides but just to show you why it may be useful so you can prepare gas sensor membranes you can pattern the surface deposit some films or use iron beam to thin down samples for example for use in tems and to dog for example uh, then it can be used for characterization of the materials rbs and drd are one of the uh, most commonly used techniques based on iron beams and you can modi modify the materials the third type of things are like some materials are used in reactors or space or they can be used as radiation detectors so whether they are performing well these can be simulated in the iron I mean, uh, our labs so with iron beams you can simulate uh, like in space the uh, devices may be experiencing the same type of flux in years that you can simulate in half an hour for example in iusc so these are the material science research programs at iusc i'll be covering many of these in the uh, coming slides here we are trying to understand how uh, interaction of ions takes place with the studied material and because of that we have different phenomena and these are de uh, studied in details okay so uh, these program rely on ion solid interaction so just to tell you what is that uh, when ion passes through the at uh, material it can lose energy with interaction to the electrons of the atoms or it can lose its energy to the nucleus of the atoms in the target so you can have energy loss uh, with two components first one is nuclear stopping power and the second one is electronic stopping power which is nothing but energy lost per unit length because of that interaction okay so in short notation it can be uh, set sn and sc sn stands for nuclear stopping power and sc stands for stop electronic stopping power So, as a function of energy, you can see how Sn and Sc are going to change. At lower energies, Sn is dominant, and at higher energies, Se is dominant. At IUC, we can have energies, even very small energies are also possible, as Dr. Pankaj told you, but mostly it is from kVs to few a couple of hundred of mevs up to here for example here so this by the way will have different values for different material and ion combination this particularly was for argon ion in silica matrix silica substrate so because of energy lost to the material uh, the ion keeps on losing its energy as it travels inside the material and at certain depth it will have very small energy or you can say it stops with zero energy and if you plot uh, stopping power as a function of depth you can have this type of variation of se and sn actually you cannot uh, see here because this is uh, at se is very large in number but there is a peak here because of sn 
so this type of thing actually is used in uh, radiation therapy uh, where se is uh, very high at particular depth and this is utilized in tumor uh, cell cure okay so now these values of SESN can be obtained by the formula but it can easily be obtained from this program which is called SRIM and this is available free online and any and all of you are encouraged to download it and see for yourself how SE and SN can vary with depth or what is the particular va value of these at particular energy okay so we have seen that uh, energy is lost to material and because of that uh, there can be different phenomena which is occurring different type of ejected particles which can happen so like uh, it can result in emission of light there can be some particle which are coming out from the near surface region which is called sputtered atoms uh, and uh, you can have recoils in the material even the incident iron can get scattered in the it will scatter in all direction depending upon the mass of uh, this um, atoms here but uh, particularly this one uh, they are utilized in rbs which we'll see later on so you can have a co cocktail of emissions so depending upon different energies we can utilize these ions for different purposes for smaller energies uh, we can have these type of applications where it can be used for uh, synthesis and if we increase little bit energy then we can use it for implantation and ion beam mixing at uh, higher energies it can be used for material modifications and uh, also for material characterization so as i told you earlier that uh, these are the uh, major uh, characterization techniques utilizing ion beams so some of them i will be covering in the uh, later on slides okay so uh, this also pankaj uh, this was in the pankaj slides so we have a uh, broad spectrum of energies available at iuac so we can have up to 300 mev from linac and 15 mv per electron is there which can give us up to 200 mv silver or gold actually i am writing silver or gold because these are mainly used by the material science people uh, the 1.7 mv and we play me and so in somebody has put to if there is some issue i think anup srivastav kindly mute yourself yes. and mr shakti uh, you can uh, close your camera video is on shall i continue please continue okay thank you uh, 1.7 mb telephone is there again i can see i can hear echo uh, i'm not sure why it is yes. everyone please mute yourself except dr saif yeah please i think now okay. it's all right okay i will continue then okay then uh, we have some tabletop accelerators also which can give uh, up to 60 kv of uh, uh, ion beams and uh, we have a soft landing setup uh, which can give very small energies of ions ions of very small energy i mean okay, I mean. okay so uh, with these ions you can have uh, you can plan some experiments so for planning the experiments uh, these are the parameters which are to be kept in mind and these parameters are fluence because if you increase the number of ions per centimeter square the modification strength extent of modification that changes and you can plan 
to vary uh, energy losses or stopping powers uh, you can vary velocity of ions uh, you can try to understand uh, if there is any synergy effect between se and sn means whether they are affecting the material in parallel okay so uh, and you can try to see how they are sensitive to stopping powers so this type of fundamental uh, questions are there so why we should use ion beams because uh, the modifications which happen they are reproducible if you start with the same ion beam combination and same fluence you may get the same result you are expected to get the same result and we can have a special selectivity uh, this can be obtained by using a mask for example and by varying the velocity or the energy of the ions you can change the depth and in lateral direction we can mask and modify selected region and we have a control modifications this is also related to uh, choice of choice of stopping power and uh, fluence uh, for fundamental studies it is better to have thin films so that you can correlate the modification with particular uh, stopping power because as we have seen that the stopping powers vary as a function of depth so if you want to correlate some modification with particular se it is better to have thin film because in the thin film uh, these stopping power will be almost constant uh, and because we are going to put this because we are going to put this uh, material in vacuum chambers it should have vacuum compatibility and uh, compared to some processes it uh, is a costly affair so uh, now i am going to show you the research problems uh, each of these research problem is itself uh, somebody's thesis so it may not be easy to uh, show uh, tell you all about it so but you will have a glimpse of these problems so i start with uh, lower energies where nuclear stopping power is dominant so here mean of mean focus is to have uh, to dope something some ion for example if you want to make a p type zinc oxide you can try doping with nitrogen or arsenic or you can use it for nano structuring the surface or you can implant something inside some some substrate and have a compound formation or you can study amorphization and recrystallization mm -hmm. uh, things so uh, i'll give you some examples uh, this is the simplest one where ion beams can be used for, for depositing thin films so this is a setup available at iusc this is called atom beam sputtering actually ions are generated from a source which are neutralized by electron shower so you can say that these are energetic atoms so these energetic atoms uh, coming out from the source they hit the target and from there you can have sputtering sputtering is nothing but ejection of atoms from the near surface because of these bombardments okay so you will have different atoms coming out from the target and these uh, sputtered species they will land on your substrate and you can get your thin films so this type of setup is very useful if you want to make nano nano composite so you can have a you can have a disk of matrix substrate uh, and then we can put some foils right here and by varying this uh, coverage we can have different filling factor in the nanocomposite if you for example uh, this is the film deposited uh, gold silica gold is the particle here and silica is the matrix so in the neighbors in the matrix in the surrounding it is silica so what the uh, the researcher did was they changed the uh, number of foils uh, which covered silica target and they can vary the percentage of gold uh, okay so 
for example, uh, this, this was varied from 3.7 to about 20%. And because of that, you can see that the particle size increased. So uh, this was very easy way to uh, synthesize a nanocomposite. And remember, this is some result. So uh, huh, this nanocomposite was synthesized without any post deposition annealing. OK, now uh, we already saw that iron beams can sputter some species, as well as it, it can produce some surface diffusion and can produce some mass flow. Uh, like in silica, it happens like this. There is a viscous flow in the amorphous region and there is surface diffusion and sputtering. All these uh, play a role to produce this type of wavy structure on the surface. So you can see the cross view also, cross section view of this. This is actually experimental result. That one was a schematic. So you can see that uh, there is a ripple structure. On AFM, you can see uh, these ripples. And these uh, ripple wavelength and amplitude, they change as a function of fluence. This is a recent work. Now we have uh, ripples. Uh, these ripples can be utilized as a template. Uh, how is that possible? Uh, so uh, we can deposit some metal on the surface in oblique angles. And if we anneal that the whole thing, then we can get, get aligned nanoparticles. Right here, uh, initially 0.5 nanometer gold was deposited on the ripple structure, ripple surfaces, and it was annealed. Uh, and we can see that there are aligned nanoparticles. If we do the same thing with the flat surface, obviously we will not see anything. Uh, any alignment and this type of alignment can be used to study uh, directional dependence of UV absorption and absorption of the samples, absorption from the samples. Okay. So now if we increase the energy, then we can have the implanted particles deep inside the substrate. Okay, like in this case, uh, Carbon was deposited with energy from 50 to 150 kV, and there is a, a distribution of carbon over here in silicon. Uh, later on, it was annealed at 1000 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, and we found and people found that uh, silicon carbide crystallites were obtained. This was confirmed from XRD patterns. So now, if we increase the energy further, we'll have a higher uh, energy loss going to uh, electronic stopping power. And our center is one of the few accelerators around the world which use swift heavy ions uh, for materials research, material science research. So what is swift heavy ion? Swift heavy ion is, uh, is an ion which is heavy and has velocity uh, more than Bohr's electron velocity. Okay, this happens around 1 MeV per uh, AMU. In this case, Electronic stopping power is much, much larger than nuclear stopping power. And because of that, uh, mostly the ion is lost, sorry, the energy is lost to excitation and ionization of atoms. And if electronic stopping power is small, then in a material you can expect to have cluster of defects uh, like this. Uh, this is along the beam direction. Oops. This is along the beam direction. And as we increase the electronic stopping power, uh, we can have elongated uh, defected regions. 
and on further increase in electronic stopping power we can expect a continuous amorphous or modified region so now uh, there is different amount of sensitivity of material with ac so insulators are very much affected uh, by electronic stopping power semiconductors some of them and metals are mostly very resistant to it so when ion goes inside a material it will eject electrons it will eject electrons and uh, these electrons will uh, collide with other uh, electrons and can uh, lead to ionization in the nearby region also so in this one is inside one is called as core and outside one is called as halo so uh, we understand that uh, when energy is lost to nucleus then actually nucleus is going to move uh, because of collision with ion but uh, if energy is lost to electrons how it is going to change to atomic motion that uh, is to be explained so prominent two models are listed here coulomb explosion model and thermal spike model uh, in coulomb explosion model what uh, is assumed is that uh, there is a positive ion core when ion is going inside the material when ion is going here it will create ions surrounding its path and because of charged uh, atoms sitting nearby they will repel each other and that is why there can be atomic motion and uh, in case of uh, thermal spike model what is happening is that ele first electrons share energy with themselves and at later stage they share energy with the lattice so that uh, this phenomena is called as electron phonon coupling and because of no lattice has energy so there can be atomic motions so this way we can say that uh, there will be some atomic displacements inside a material uh, like here we can see that this type of uh, uh, atomic motions can result in atom ejection so i'll quickly go through this because later on dr uday will be telling you about electron electronic stopping power in more details but uh, this is just for uh, may, it may not be in his slides so i am showing you uh, so we saw that there is ejection of atoms from uh, due to ion bombardment and if we catch these ejected atoms on the tm grid we can understand how uh, the ejection process is happening from the material and how uh, these agglomerations are happening so recently we saw that uh, if we have a small uh, zinc in silica uh, we have uh, more sputtering as compared to this sample which has hard, larger zinc so here the particles zinc particles on the tm grid which was used as a catcher has uh, uh, more sputtering but it is not a clear here but uh, from rbs setup we have seen that sputtering was more from this uh, from uh, 2% zinc as compared to 10% but if more zinc is sputtered from this sample it should have more uh, bigger particles of zinc here on the tm grid but this did not happen uh, so we feel that uh because this uh, particle size on the tm grid is almost comparable to the particle size on the irradiated films we feel that uh whole cluster whole zinc particle got sputtered uh, similar things were obtained in uh, halide films also so i will skip this uh, next i am coming to ion beam mixing so when ion goes through a material it can lead to melting as we have seen earlier that there can be 
temperature spike because of which is explained by thermal spike model uh, so iron can induce some melting and because of melting there can be high, high degree of mobility okay it can be even liquid state mobility because that there can be interdiffusion at the interface and which can on further ion irradiation it can uh, mix the whole two layers like uh, this is an example uh, where cobalt and antimony films were deposited on fused silica substrate and this is by the way rbs spectrum so from rbs spectrum it can be seen uh, because of you you can see the tailing earlier these two peaks were separate so <clears throat> because of that uh, we can say that uh, there is intermixing of the atoms at the interface and finally uh, there were compound formation after annealing so we can see that cobalt uh, tries as uh, ending uh, sorry sb is what is sb okay hello hello yeah antimony ha ah, antimony antimony oh. oh great thank you so people are awake okay so, uh, because of ion irradiation there can be amorphization huh? uh, and this is particularly not desirable when you are implanting some species in a substrate so to get back to uh, crystalline state we can use use swift heavy ions like in this case uh, silicon nitride layer was reobtained by irradiation with 70 mg silicon okay uh, because at the interface of amorphous to recrystalline uh, interface uh, because ions are producing atomic motion so the atoms sitting at wrong place get activated and moves to the correct position so we have to tune electronic stopping in such a way that further amorphization is not there and we can get crystallinity again okay and now coming to nano structures suppose uh, we have a spherical structures gold embedded in silica uh, once we irradiate with swift heavy ion if the track size the modified region that is smaller than the nanoparticle size people have shown that this can result in elongation of nanoparticles if the track size is large then people have shown that the size of the nanoparticles changes okay uh, so that was for nanoparticles but here if we have voids uh, the voids the shape of voids can also change like here it is demonstrated uh, if we irradiate with uh, 100 mev silver with two fluence of 10 to the power 14 we can have a void which is elongated elliptical shaped ellipsoid okay uh, because ions are uh, generating lot of energy inside so there can be uh, annealing effect there can be pressure build up because of that uh, you can expect grain growth or uh, grain fragmentation here it is shown grain growth then next one is uh, reduction in size so average crystalline size decreased as a function of fluence for titania case now if we if we have some mixture then ion can result ion beam can result in phase separation like siu x film was there which is uh, more in silica silicon sorry uh, if more silicon is there in this uh, so i mean sub oxide film is there and if we irradiate with uh, swift heavy ion for example 150 mb silver here uh, it resulted in silicon nanocrystals uh, coming to the 2d type of material uh, we can have uh, 
purification of graphene as an example where id by ig they show id deep peak and deep peak are uh, from raman spectroscopy so if we plot the id by ig ratio of uh, the film as a function of fluence we, we saw that earlier the damage decreased and when we increased the fluence the damage increased so ion passing through the material will create a core type of structure in between which is smaller in diameter and which is surrounded by a halo region which can be used can be used as a uh, annealing effect for annealing effect and the core is actually doing the damage so both are playing role here and we have an interplay of these as can be seen from this graph okay uh, ion beam can also change the magnetic properties i think i am running short of time so uh, i will now go to uh, the irradiation facilities at iuac so uh, from electron we have uh, seven beam lines and from these seven beam lines two of them are used for material science research uh, primarily this one is used this this has a irradiation chamber here uh, then uhv chamber which has online rga facility third one is for rbs channeling and there is one gpsc chamber which has low flux setup now uh, the zero degree beam line goes to linac and there also we have a material science beam line uh, which has uh, in situ micro raman one irradiation chamber and in situ xrd facility so uh, this is this slide shows how we can put our samples this is one of the ladder available at iuc uh, people can put their samples here they actually they have to paste it by silver paste or uh, some sticking tape then there is a quartz here which is used to find the uh, location of the beam while tuning and to find the shape of the beam and for scanning purpose so this ladder is first loaded with samples and then it is put in the chamber this way so this is one of the ladders so and one of the chamber because uh, we have many chambers here first one is high vacuum chamber in beam hall one uh, which i showed in scheme in the schematics then uh, we have ultra high vacuum chamber with rga connected and the third one is goniometer chamber for rbs channeling and in gpsc we have uh, this setup which is called as low flux setup uh, so primary ions will have very high flux 10 to power 9 ions per second so if we scatter them with a gold thin gold file we can have a scattered ions and these scattered ions can be utilized uh, for device testing for membrane fabrication another purpose but here the main thing is that the flux is small so if you want a smaller flux then this type of setup can be used otherwise uh, smaller flux is not accessible through direct beam so with low flux setup uh, we can use it for uh, energy loss expect, uh, energy loss and struggling measurement this is fundamental studies and uh, we can use it to create modified regions inside a material and these can be etched out using certain chemical and we can have a pore which is shown from here top view of that or we can use it uh, this setup to study how device grid sorry space grid devices are behaving under irradiation this is particularly useful for those type of material so now coming to the beam line second beam line so this one has a irradiation chamber this one uh, it has a provision to have high temperature ladder which can heat up the temperature heat up the sample to 1000 degrees centigrade uh, during irradiation okay and uh, we have in situ xrd chamber in situ raman chamber then there are two low energy ion beam lines one with uh, negative ion source this is the chamber and uh, 
The second one is with the low energy beam facility with ECR source, and this one has a chamber over here. So this one, this is for low energies. Now, IUSC has uh, many of the facilities for characterization of these samples. Uh, some of them I may uh, be able to take up. Like uh, we have uh, online facility which is called online residual gas analysis, where we can study what are the ejected uh, particles during during irradiation. So this is uh, has a five per QMA four twenty two which can an, uh, analyze partic ejected particles so from one KMU to one zero two four KMU. Uh, with this, uh, we saw that what are the gases coming out from PT polyethylene tetrathlate. So these are the type of gases which are coming out during irradiation and how that uh, evolution is changing with time. Or fluence that is plotted here and from this curve we can also find out uh, same thing is plotted here in log log so from this we can find out what is the track dimension I mean the modified zone diameter okay. now uh, there is a, a online elastic recoil detection and, and setup which can measure the profile of different elements in the material. So, for example, if we have a, a calcium fluoride, so uh, the recoils coming out from the sample during irradiation uh, will have different elements calcium, fluorine, uh, substrate silicon, oxygen. We have so whatever elements are present inside the material that can be detected and from this spectrum we can find out what is the percentage of different elements in the material okay in situ xrd is there this is unique because uh, it it has a chamber vacuum chamber and beam comes from this direction and here's the sample and we can record xrd after irradiation it is possible to cool the samples to 10k and we can put some gas or means when beam is not there we can put some gas and record xrd so these uh, features are very unique types uh, and this setup was uh, used for uh, uh, studying how uh, particle size is varying with fluence. So this is the XRD pattern. Pankaj, how many how many minutes left? Uh, yeah, you have uh, although exceeded time, but you can please try to finish it there soon. Acha, uh, this one I would like to take uh, because some material are used for uh, disposing of radioactive. Uh, waste huh? so people want to see how th that material behaves under uh, irradiation so first mo foremost thing is to study structure how is structure is going to change so in this case uh, it, uh, barium titanate was studied uh, and its xrd pattern was recorded at different fluence uh, and this was at 25 kelvin and this was at 300 kelvin At different temperatures, it has different phases. So uh, it can be seen that uh, rhomboidal phase is more radiation resistant, and this rhomboidal is present at 183 Kelvin. Okay, so by changing uh, the temperature of irradiation, uh, the researchers have chosen different phases of the material, and they have seen which phase is more uh, resistant to irradiation okay uh, now this is in situ micro ramen where uh, uh, the sample is put here and irradiated from this side and uh, raman spectrum uh, spectrum is recorded from here by putting laser here okay and third one is uh, sorry the last one which is online type this is ionoluminescence so ion beam and falls on the material it can lead to emission of light 
so recording the light in spectrum can give us information about ion matter interaction what are the defects which are created and what are the impurities available so these can be studied used using the ionoluminescence facility at iusc now we have uh, many offline facilities like rbs channeling setup is there uh, this pankaj has already covered so i will skip uh, we have a transmission electron microscope uh, recently being installed uh, which can have up to 200 kv of electrons and uh, the provisions are tm imaging stm imaging eds and eels is also there And for uh, sample preparation, there is a, a setup uh, here, which has a uh, ion beam based uh, thinning, thinning of sample from GATAN. We have atomic force microscope to find out uh, surface structures. A scanning electron microscope from TESCAN. Uh, photoluminescence setup. UVB spectrophotometer and new this is the new one which can go up to near infrared uh, we have low temperature magneto transport setup and there are several facilities for synthesis of material like uh, there is a thermal evaporation setup uh, there are actually a couple of them uh, then there is the RF sputting setup. So uh, with this type of research, we should be try to understand what is happening in the material and what are the different relaxation processes, how energy is getting transferred, how strain is getting created, how defects are creating. So uh, these are uh, there are different models which try to explain these things. So can we? The question is whether we can have a general model which can explain all these process and uh, we can use uh, uh, these modifications to engineer something so we can try out that thing uh, we can use it for nano structuring and uh, we can study uh, the stability of different material which are prone to radiation because they are going to be used in some radiation environment so this is um, material science group which is headed by dr ambush tripathi who is the program leader, uh, Dr. Ashokan, Dr. Kabiraj, Dr. Shiv Kumar, Dr. Foran Singh, uh, myself, Dr. Uh, Pavan Kularia, Dr. Indra Sulanya, uh, Mr. Ram Charan Meena, Mr. Ambuj Mishra. Okay, so thank you for your patience. I hope I could give you some glimpse of what are the activities and facilities at IESC for material science research. Thank you, Dr. Saif. And it was nicely presented the facilities uh, related to material science research. Um, I would request everyone to type their questions in the chat box because uh, we don't see any questions. So either you are getting everything or you are not getting anything. Okay. But, uh, to, <laughs> Actually, to there is a separate session, I think, for. Uh, this type of discussion. So, if people have question that by that time, they can question us. Yeah, that time also you can ask. But if you have any question, keep typing so that we can discuss those questions in the discussion. Fine. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sir, once again. Thank now you, I request. Uh, yeah. Now I request uh, um, Dr. Uday Bhan Singh. Dr. Sir, can you stop sharing, please, so that. So uh, we have uh, next speaker is Dr. Uday Van Singh. Dr. Uday is uh, a faculty in uh, Dindyal Upadhyay, uh, Gorakhpur University, Gorakhpur. And in fact, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, he is uh, our student. He has been our student, in fact. So he did PhD from IUSC on uh, synthesis of novel metal nanostructures by ion beam radiation with uh, uh, Dr. D. Kavasti. Um, and uh, after that, he was uh, an PDF, National Postdoctoral Fellow at IIT Delhi. 
and um, then he is a uh, faculty. He has published uh, 35 uh, plus publications in uh, various uh, high impact journals. Um, and uh, also having a grant from uh, SCRV DST. Um, I request uh, uh, Dr. Uday kindly start your talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your nice introduction. So first, I want to thank the organizer for giving uh, this platform to present my research work. So uh, the topic of my research is electronic spotry uh, in gold pen fin. Uh, gold pen fin. Uh, as we go from the uh, bulk to nano dimensional system, then there are different physical properties of material change with uh, size. So it influences the property of material. So it also influences the electronic spotting. So I will discuss how this property is changed uh, in electronic sputtering, which is mainly due to the influence of mean free path of electron and phonon. So I arrange my talk first. I briefly introduce about uh, this uh, sputtering and uh, why we have chosen this problem. So at scientific background and motivation, then result and discussion. And finally, I conclude my presentation. So what is sputtering? Sputtering is uh, ejection of atom due to ion bombardment. And it is quantified with the term sputtering. And sputtering yield is equal to the number of ejected uh, atoms from the surface and divided by number of incidence and so they uh, according to uh, energy loss there are two types of uh, sputtering nuclear sputtering and electronic sputtering Nu and nuclear sputtering is due to the uh, nuclear energy loss when we uh, hit the material then due to the transfer of moments there are there occurs cascade collisions is formed and due to the process of uh, transfer of momentum, some atoms on the surface get energy more than the binding energy. So it get uh, ejected from the surface. And it depends upon the uh, electronic energy loss and atomic density and surface binding energy and many parameters. And uh, nuclear sputtering is well uh, understood on different material and it has a very well known of, uh, theory by given by P Peter Sigmund. So uh, in this, there is no hope uh, at least. So therefore, we took the electronic sputtering problem. So uh, what is the electronic sputtering? Sput electronic sputtering is phenomena uh, of ejection due to the electronic energy loss. And in this regime, regime there is very large sputtering yield. And there are so many models, but still at to, to understand that complete electronic sputtering by a theory. There are so many models. Coulomb explosion, thermal spike model, combination of com Coulomb explosion and thermal spike, shock wave model, and thermodynamical model. So what is uh, generally uh, we take thermal spike model because it is the generally succeed to explain the behavior of uh, uh, ion interaction uh, in many, many cases. So what is the thermal spike model? In this model, they uh, consider material as a two subsystem, electronic subsystem and lattice system. When, when we hit the material, then it passes through the material and deposited in deposited energy by electronic energy loss and uh, nuclear energy loss. And first it deposited energy to the electronic subsystem and then transfer to the lattice, uh, lattice subsystem. And in this model, we they took a cylindrical geometry system, differential equation, and E for this uh, electronic subsystem and A, Subscript is for the lattice subsystem. And 
and mainly there are different parameter which is used for the uh, explaining the thermal spike model just like electron phonon coupling thermal conductivity and specific heat generally they use bulk parameter and when uh, sputtering occurs when lattice temperature should equal to or greater than than ev evaporation temperature so why we took metals in metal gen for a long time it was considered that it to be unrealistic because due to the high con high mobility of the conduction sun so what happens it has high conduction it quickly smear out the deposited energy and quickly neutralize the ion uh, neutralize the ionized ion So in in, uh, in literature, electronic sputtering is only few orders. Uh, the electronic sputtering field is three to fourteen atoms per ion, and no models uh, are able to explain uh, this uh, complete phenomena. This electronic is only this is due to the electronic energy loss. And in this paper, they uh, so the effect of synergy means the both combination electronic energy loss and a nuclear energy loss both uh, combined effect showing the electronic sputtering in this region but our group uh, took the problem and on gold thin film and they showed that no there is very huge sputtering in uh, in the case of thin film as we go from the bulk to thin film case so what happened when we go from the bulk to nano uh, uh, thin film case they, in this uh, uh, paper prb ajay gupta and dk avasti showed that this sputtering is order of uh, around in the case of 15 nanometer it is 410 atoms per incident sign and 235 atoms per incident sign in the case of 45 nanometer and uh, this uh, in nimbi paper by uh, misra uh, kensi misra group they also showed same thing but they explain this is because reduction of this mobility of electrons and it when you go from uh, bigger to smaller region then the effective mean free path of electron uh, varies this is the they explain only by Uh, theoretical, not any simulation or any any method. So, uh, uh, in this uh, case, now we showed how what is the main reason for this huge sputtering by simulation and theoret theoretically. Uh, we have deposited five nanometer, twenty nanometer, and fifty nanometer, and we take. took a thin thick film which is larger than the mean free path so we can uh, see that what is the effect of this mean free path and we find uh, uh, this that there is huge sputtering in the case of thinner film and is and in the 200 nanometer it is uh, exactly same as bulk so it it suitable to use uh, bulk parameter for the simulation in nano dimensional case because many literature shows that as we go from the bulk to nano dimensional system then different parameters are changed there are uh, enhancement in the electron phonon coupling which is uh, responsible for the uh, transfer from energy from electronic system to lattice system there are some literatures and reduction in thermal conductivity so reduction in thermal conductivity will increase the lattice temperature and shows the higher sputtering yield third parameter we generally use that specific heat with reduction it is also enhancement is observed so we have decided to refinement in the physical parameter and we uh, so generally we recall that uh, thermal spike we use this bulk parameter to simulate the our results in uh, different model for different purpose here 
we now uh, refine uh, this uh, g electron phonon coupling thermal conductivity and specific heat so as we go uh, go from uh, smaller to higher uh, size uh, effect of grain we have observed that in the smaller case the huge sputtering object in the as as compared to larger size and same in the effect of thickness in the smaller thickness uh, we observe huge sputtering as compared to uh, thicker film so what happened we uh, calculated the effective mean free path and as we i already uh, informed you that uh, as we go from the, uh, the thinner case or goes to smaller region then effective mean free path change so we q and t theory model and uh, kumar valdis a model and they showed that with increase in the, with increase in the size with uh, and uh, grain the variation in electron mean free path is observed and we have calculated that uh, electron phonon coupling is increased from bulk to a uh, 5 nanometer case is around 10 times and similarly we have uh, also calculated the mean free path of the uh, mean free path of the phonon which also responsible for the in uh, reduction in the thermal conductivity and we have not took uh, the case of specific heat because it uh, uh, in our case there is a very small change is observed now we uh, refine the parameter and uh, and simulate uh, this with uh, thermal spy calculation we observe uh, in the thicker film uh in that uh, as we in uh, refine the parameter it uh, increases the lattice temperature this uh, lower is uh, when we use bulk parameter for case but if we use the uh, this one for the thin film case and we observe that duration of this time duration of time is decreased with increase in the thickness so what happened this the large electronic sputtering process is explained in the framework of the thermal spike model including the refinement in electron phonon coupling and thermal conductivity and you can see that it uh, with uh, refined parameter this is a, a spherical legend shows the experimental result and star one is the simulation result with refined parameter is almost able to explain not exactly but we are uh, able to it's uh, uh, able to it's successful to explain this why this uh, huge sputtering is observed as we go from the uh, bulk to thinner case thin film case now we conclude that the considering refinement in the value of g and k in the thermal spike it shows the large uh, uh, increase in the lattice temperature and sublim time of duration of this sublimation temperature which correspond to the uh, sputtering yield as large uh, sublimation duration it shows large sputtering and smaller is uh, 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 less sputtering the reduction in thermal conductivity and enhancement is coupling are responsible for the large sputtering in thinner case now uh, still we have uh, uh, many problems are left so we in future maybe i took uh, from my students they can uh, take this problem and do some uh, better refinement in this parameter and thermal spike model Uh, presently they are uh, my collaborators dr ambush tripathi dr indra sulaniya and uh, mr sunil oja from iusc and uh, my guide dr dk avasti from mit and my postdoc uh, mentor professor santru ghosh from iit delhi and my friend and my colleague uh, dr tanuj dr dc agrawal 
and uh, my senior professor Arab Sankar Singh from DDU Gorakhpur University, Dr. Vinit Kumar Singh, and Dr. Sintu Kumar from the uh, from Gorakhpur University, and they they are my PhD students, Mr. Binay Kumar Sivasto and Shivani Sivar Chaudhary. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Uday. Very good talk, and in fact, you finished in time. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, um, there are a lot of questions being, uh, you know, uh, typed here in chat box. That we will take later on. Uh, now, okay, sir. Yeah. Um, now we have a last talk, in fact, by Manohar. Right. Sir Rajiv Manohar, yeah. University Rajiv, of Lucknow. Yeah. yeah, so uh, next talk is by uh, Dr. Rajiv Manohar. He is a professor in uh, University of Lucknow, Physics Department. And uh, he will be talking about nanoparticle liquid crystal composite and its potential application. I request uh, Professor Rajiv uh, to share your slides. Yeah, yes, slides. Yeah. Thank you. Please start. Thank you. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. You are muted. Please unmute first. Yes. I, now I am audible. Yes, you are audible now. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, my friend uh, Professor uh, K. K. Verma, and also uh, from Ioka side. Also, I would like to thank Director. Uh, uh, Inter University Accelerator Center, Professor Pande. Uh, so, without taking much time, I would like to start. I will be talking on uh, nanoparticle liquid crystal composites and their applications. So, first of all, my uh, outline of the talk is like this. Uh, I will just give a brief of liquid crystals, what are liquid crystals, and then uh, something about this emerging uh, field of nanotechnology. Then, I would like to give you some brief of how this, these nanoparticle systems, they work in liquid crystalline host material. So we'll be some, talking something about gas host material in a uh, uh, span of 30 to uh, 40 seconds. Fine. Then I'll be coming to our investigations. I would like to show you how these nanoparticles can improve properties and parameters of the liquid crystalline materials, which are important for their application in electro-optical and optical devices. So I will be concentrating on relaxation dynamics, photoluminescence, electro-optical parameters, and if time allows me, then I would like to show you one of the application that is diffraction rating and finally conclusion. So uh, first of all, I would like to tell you that liquid crystalline materials are the intermediate phase of matter between crystalline solid and isotropic phase. Most of you know about those uh, these uh, materials. Uh, for students uh, uh, who might have joined, uh, we have crystalline phase, we have isotropic phase. In crystalline phase, we say that total order is there. In isotropic phase, we say that they are randomly orientated. But in some of the phases, some of the material, there exist some phases which may be having some order even then they are randomly oriented. So say, uh, we can say that they are having some orientational order. So they may be having a smectic phase like this one, then a smectic A phase like this one. They show beautiful textures when they are placed under the polarized light. These are some of the molecular arrangement of smectic uh, nematic phase, cholesteric phase, smectic A phase, and the smectic C phase. You might notice that in some of the phases, my, my, uh, molecular orientational order is there, while some of the phases do have positional order as well. So these are known as the smectic phases, and these smectic phases they have um, they are the nearest to the crystalline structure. Another important uh, discovery that has been done in liquid crystalline field that is ferroelectric liquid crystal. So ferroelectric liquid crystals basically they are smectic liquid smectic C type of liquid crystal where all the molecules they are aligned in a particular direction and having a tilt with this z-axis and they also have chirality chirality we all know that 
it is the rotation of the optical axis when we move from one layer to the other layer so uh, on the right hand side of the slide you can see the model so when any uh, liquid crystalline material is ferroelectric in nature it has a spontaneous polarization so what we can say uh, the relevance of this other type of liquid crystalline devices we have uh, normally associated in a different manner while in this particular case Dr. Manohar, we cannot hear you. Hello. Yeah, you. Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, now, now we can hear you. Go on, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, uh, in in these type of ferroelectric li uh, liquid crystalline material, we do have a spontaneous polarization, and that in plane switching is there. So, the uh, uh, switching time has been improved a lot. That means we can say we move from the millisecond up to the microsecond. So, uh, what we do in liquid crystalline material, we do, uh, we uh, may uh, dope some uh, dyes or polymers or nanoparticles into these liquid crystalline material as a uh, host material, and these uh, uh, non-mesogenic or non-liquid crystalline material as the uh, dopant material or the gas material, and just by putting a small amount of a very small fraction of these uh, particular materials the properties of the liquid crystalline material changes a lot i would like to show you some of the results these are the nano materials which we may use for uh, putting in uh, uh, doping into the liquid crystalline material we know a lot about nanoparticles so i won't be uh, going into a discussion in the nanoparticle i'll be concentrating on this host material and the gas material so another important thing in the nanomaterial uh, the advent of the quantum dot you increase the size of the uh, quantum dot and you can uh, see the change in the wavelength so we know we can uh, dope uh, these quantum dots as well into the liquid crystalline material because uh, they are quite compatible to be uh, imbibed into the liquid crystalline material so as i come to the results section i have been using this ferroelectric liquid crystalline material which is having this ferroelectric phase between uh, minus 26 degree uh, to 70 degree this is magnetic c star phase is ferroelectric in nature so i'll be concentrating uh, my results around this sample only so this sample is a commercial sample that means it has all the optimized properties and then we try to uh, optim uh, further uh, increase some of the beneficial properties by doping uh, uh, nanoparticles or the nanomaterials so this is the usual procedure normally we uh, make a solution of the nanoparticle then ultrasonication process has been going on magnetic steering then known uh, nanoparticle plus ferroelectric liquid crystal has been mixed so uh, this is how we finally form that composite which has to be used for the measurement okay so uh, sometime we use surfactant sometime we don't use surfactant but one important thing is uh, one th uh, point is very important whenever we imbibe nanoparticle or introduce nanoparticle into the system we have to cap them because they have a tendency to aggregate so i'll be uh, taking one by one this is something about relaxation dynamics of the system so you may see that what we did we have doped zns in mixture one zns nanoparticle with magnesium ion 20 molar percentage uh, molar percentage uh, concentration in the mixture two and zns with MN240 molar concentration and 40 is the uh, maximum amount of the molar concentration as far as literature suggests which can be um, uh, imbibed into the ZNS nanoparticle. So here it has some of the unique properties, some uh, photoluminescence and other properties um, uh, appears uh, accordingly. So first of all, I would like to discuss about the relaxation uh, dynamics of the system. This is the, you may see that two relaxation peaks are coming up. Uh, here is uh, one is on the lower side one is on the higher side and another important thing which we have noticed that there is another peak which has come for the mixture three that is mixture three that means the uh, mixture with zns mn2 plus nanoparticle where 40 molar percentage concentration of the mn2 particle has been introduced into the zn nanoparticle so uh, this is an additional relaxation peak that is coming up due to this mixing of the nanoparticle or the doping of the nanoparticle. Another important factor is that uh, if you see that uh, these peaks, they these peaks they are changing their, their height 
and they show uh, th because this peak is arising basically due to the ionic contamination in the liquid crystalline material and whenever quantum dot has been introduced into the system you may see that the they have a tendency uh, the ions they absorb ions because of their high surface to volume ratio and because they absorb ions that relaxation peak goes down these are the textures these are the textures that has been this is for the pure liquid crystal and this is for uh, liquid crystal plus nanoparticle and these textures have been taken in the unaligned position so you may see that just by imbibing those nanoparticle the textures of the uh samples has been changed which suggests that they may be having some type of align preferential alignment these are the uh, dark and the bright state of the uh, textures uh, for uh, nanoparticle dope system uh, first one is for the pure second one is for mixture one where only zns nanoparticle has been uh, introduced second one is for zns plus uh, MN2 20 molar percent uh, percent concentration and third one is for 40 molar percentage concentration of MN2 nanoparticle and you may see in the second picture that contrast ratio has been improved that is one of the very important factor that has to be taken care of whenever we are talking about some electro optic device or the optical device so contrast ratio has been found to increase uh, improve quite a lot for ZNS nanoparticle and only in the last texture you may see that some aggregation some um, black dots are uh, coming up in the texture they show the aggregation because i have already told you this mn40 molar percentage concentration in the zns nanoparticle is the maximum amount of the uh, concentration of manganese ion so uh, size of the particle is maximum at this time and that aggregation has been reflected due to that so this is basically the relaxation system we uh, uh, what we try to do this is for 30 uh, 35 per, uh, degree centigrade then this is for uh, 45 and at 45 degree you may see that this is for pure liquid crystal this is for the nanoparticle doped liquid crystal uh, these graphs are for mixture 3 so you may see that at 55 degree this uh, another uh, relaxation peak at 10 to the five, uh, power 5 uh, hertz is coming up that means another relaxation mode is coming up and with the increase in the temperature it is increasing so what we can say and um, then it keeps on uh, continuing what we can say that is another relaxation peak which is coming up just because of the introduction of uh, these type of nanoparticles this is one factor so this is the enlarged image of that particular uh, relaxation peak so uh, this starts from the 55 degrees so what we can say this is a temperature dependent relaxation mode that is coming up so uh, another important point was this that these lower type of uh, relaxation they are known as goldstone mode while on the uh, higher side they are known as um, soft mode so somebody may get confused with the soft mode and this uh, particular ito mode so uh, what we did we have also plotted relaxation strength and the relaxation frequency of the uh, for this particular system and uh, we found that this particular relaxation mode is quite different in comparison to the soft mode because if we uh, have a look at the right hand side corner of the picture where frequency versus loss has been plotted with the variation of voltage so you may see that relaxation peak is not going down that it has not been suppressed if it has been soft mode uh, it would have been suppressed with the introduction of electric field. So that is what confirms that another uh, that a new relaxation mode, which is temperature dependent, has come into existence uh, with the doping of this ZNS MN2 plus 40 molar percentage nanoparticle. These are some other results. Uh, I will not be going into the detail, but uh, but I would like to show you their importance. This is normalized PL intensity. And you may see that for pure uh, liquid crystal, it is quite high, while uh, for the dope system, it has decreased. So what we can see, these particles can also be used as optical quencher. Normally, we use uh, optical quencher, uh, any type of optical quencher. They have a tendency of fading away. 
so here we can say that these type of nanoparticles can be used as an optical quencher for the uh, liquid crystalline system and this is uh, one of the important result another uh, important thing is the electro optical parameters here i have shown three electro optical parameters this is the primary order parameter uh, that is uh, ap uh, the apparent tilt angle tilt angle of the ferroelectric liquid crystalline molecule then secondary order parameter is the uh, spontaneous polarization and finally electro optical response has been plotted so here you can see that the uh, mixture two the uh, mixture two that is uh, mixture doped with uh, zns nanoparticle with 20 molar percentage of magnesium ion into it shows the ultra fast electro optical switching that means it can be used for uh, ultra fast electro optical devices this particular system and the dopant concentration was 0.25% weight to weight so this is uh yeah this is this this i want to show that almost 75% faster optical response has been found so we have given the details into our uh, paper i will be uh, giving you the reference finally i would like to take uh, another five minutes before I conclude, because these results are having some important significance uh, significance for the devices. Uh, this is of a state of a system where two cross polarizer, that is polarizer and analyzer, has been placed, and in between that, ferroelectric liquid crystalline material or the mixture has been placed. So, off a state, you can see that the light is not coming out. In the on a state, light is coming out. That is how an ideal display system should work, but normally it is not that ideal because the basic diffraction phenomena is there so in the case of open state the light gets diffracted as well so uh, this these dip, this diffracted light is very uh, annoying for the display engineers because the brightness has gone down intensity of the uh, display has gone down but we have tried to use this diffraction of the light in, uh, for developing some type of diffraction grid you all know what a diffraction grating is and what a switchable grating. So basically, switchable grating is a grating where you can uh, get the desired pattern, diffraction pattern at desired conditions. So basically, previously also some of the researchers have worked on that liquid crystals and diffraction gratings, and they have used azo dyes as layer. They have also used uh, some different type of layers, but they have been able to achieve only 40 to 50 percent of the efficiency, which was not much higher to be of any practical use. So I would just like to show you a simple experiment what we have done in our laboratory. That is, we have developed a liquid crystalline sample holder. It is a IPO coated uh, sandwich type of standard liquid crystalline cell. And this is the optical setup. The source has been used with one polarizer and one analyzer. Uh, here we have placed the liquid crystalline material in the sample, and a screen has been used to uh, uh, take a, a photograph of the diffraction pattern. So, at the place of a screen, we have used a camera to uh, photograph a diffraction pattern. So, this is what has come up. So in this particular setup, we have used the uh, same ferroelectric liquid crystal that is Ferlex uh, 17100. Uh, and, uh, but the dopant nanoparticle has been changed. Here we have used single walled carbon nanotubes. Single walled carbon nanotubes. So this is the intensity profile. This is for the bright state. This is for the dark state. And you may uh, see that uh, in the dark state, first order diffraction lobes are coming up. So what we did, we have taken the intensity profile. This is the intensity profile for the dark. So you may see that there is a principal maxima with first order diffraction lobes. Okay, you can refer this particular paper. This paper has been published in Applied Physics Letters. Uh, it's an old work, but this is an important work uh, to show the importance of these nanoparticles uh, in the development of the devices. So another uh, uh, experiment we have performed that we have also changed the bias voltage. And you can see that if we increase the bias voltage, this principal lobe that has been coming down, this principal maxima is coming down, uh, sorry. This principal maxima is coming down while the diff uh, first order diffraction lobes, they are swelling up, they are, their intensity has been increasing. Yeah, this is clear. Okay, up to eight volt. So after eight volt, if we are increasing the voltage up to 11 or 14 volts, no uh, significant change has been found. So this is one of the observation. Now I would like to show you the system with 
25% single wall carbon nanotube dope system and 0.5% nanotube uh, nanotube dope system so this is for the pure this is for 0.25 nanotube and this is for 0.5 nanotube and here you can see for pure sample there is only first order diffraction lobes while for the second uh, that is 0.25 nano per, uh, percentage of single wall carbon nanotube dope system uh, first order diffraction lobes are quite clear while for the higher concentration and uh, secondary lobes are visible so this is the intensity profile of the system you can see that the first order lobes are there and what is happening when we are doping them with the single wall carbon nanotube the principal maxima is going down while the first order diffraction lobes are swelling up okay and you can see that these orange lines that is for 0.5% single wall carbon uh, single wall carbon nanotube dope system the first order diffraction lobes are even higher in comparison to the principal maxima this is one observation another observation is that these peaks are going away that means the maxima of the first order diffraction lobe is going away from the principal maxima so for, from this observation we can uh, conclude that uh, whenever we are doping them with the single wall carbon nanotube obviously the diffraction uh, diffraction element is been reducing that is why these diffraction lobes are first order or second order diffraction lobes they are going away from the principal maxima okay second uh, is very important that is the peak of the first order diffraction lobe for 0.5% concentration of the dopant is higher in comparison to principal maxima what is what it reflect basically it reflect that we have achieved efficiency more than 100% so efficiency more than 100% yes basically it is possible in the uh, vol uh, volume phase rating so we are talking about a volume phase rating this is the intensity uh, uh, equation for the diffraction orders and this is the diffraction efficiency formula we have taken out so what we uh, have observed that uh, during our theoretical calculation there is a decrease of period of 29% and that can result only up to the 59% increase in the efficiency but what we have been getting we have been getting increase in efficiency up to 126% 120% or 0.5 uh percentage concentration of the dopant so we uh, uh, just to uh, get an uh, conclusive answer for this particular uh, uh, observation what we did we have rotated the analyzer and this is the curve uh, where we have rotated the analyzer in comparison to uh, uh, in comparison to the polarizer and uh, and what we found that it is periodically changing which suggests that whenever light is passing through this 0.5 concentrate uh, 0.5 uh, percentage concentration of single nanotube dope system the single uh, the plane of polarization of the light is also rotating with the uh, it is rotating the plane of polarization of the uh, total uh, plane of polarization of the light coming out and which is adding up to the diffraction first order diffraction lobe and that is why the efficiency has become quite high this is the reason why this efficiency has become quite high so what uh, i would like to conclude here that nanomaterials are the potential candidate to induce new relaxation dynamics in the ferroelectric liquid crystals they can change the photoluminescence of the system that we have seen they can change the alignment as well that texture study shows that and they can change the electro optical parameter but and they also can be used for electro optical and optical devices effectively that i have shown in a diffraction rating system but these changes are dependent on the type of nanoparticle size of nanoparticle concentration of nanoparticle and obviously on the capping or the core shell structure of the nanoparticle that has to be taken care of necessarily so finally i would like to acknowledge my research scholars also department of science and technology isro department of atomic energy university grant commission for continuously giving grants to our laboratory that is liquid crystal laboratory situated in the physics department lucknow and also i would like to state uh, thanks state government for conferring shikshak shri samman and saraswati samman uh, uh, in the consecutive year of 2017 and 18 to me these are my collaborators i am thankful to them as well and finally i am thanking uh, you uh, all of you for your kind attention thank you thank you uh, professor manohar
and without wasting time i would request uh, dr kk sharma professor kk verma to continue his talk on uh, carbon uh, nano composites he is professor in uh, ramanor lohia avadi university professor verma please start uh anwar please stop sharing please stop sharing first so that uh, professor verma can start sharing yes. Yeah, you see the slides. Yes. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my uh, work with all of you. This may be benefit beneficial to our students also who are viewing this uh, event organized jointly by Department of Physics and Electronics, Dr. Ramana Lohi Awad University and Ayuka, New Delhi. So I am going to discuss about repression of in situ polymerized PMMA. Uh, MW CNT dope nano composites, uh, graphite intercalated compound preparation and exfoliated graphite preparation and its characterization. So, this is the outline of my talk. I will uh, give a little introduction about the conducting polymer benefits of CNTs to polymers, exper some experimental details, preparation of GIC and EG, some of the applications, uh, what is percolation threshold, electrical properties, structural uh, characterization, and some result and discussion that will be representative example of the work that has been done at our place. So, as far as conducting polymer composite is concerned, uh, we should know first what is polymer. Polymer are large molecular weight chemical compound consisting of number of repeated structural units, monomers that is called linked together by covalent bonds. These materials are usually insulators by but by incorporating some metals or MWCNT, SWCNT, you can tailor these polymer material into a conducting one, and that shows wonderful properties. <coughs> uh, these composites can easily be fo formed various into various complicated shapes by traditional techniques like extrusion, injection molding, etc. Uh, these are some of the conducting fillers that has been used by different authors. Uh, here we have used uh, MWCNT and exfoliated graphite. The benefits of CNTs to polymer are numerous. Some of these are electrical conductivity. These become electrically conducting after doping to the polymer matrix improvement of mechanical properties especially strength enhancement of 
enhancement of thermal stability enhancement of thermal conductivity enhancement of oxidation stability effect at low cnt is contents because of very high aspect ratio uh, the experimental procedure in situ polymerization involves doping of uh, mw cnts into methyl methacrylate uh, polymer polyvinyl methyl uh, methacrylate uh, and bpo benzyl peroxide is added uh, which is a polymerizing agent and continuous sonication and heating is uh, being performed and then disc, disc shaped samples of this material were cut from the obtained black solid after polymerization so uh, i have uh, put this uh, calculation for uh, those uh, researcher or uh, students who may be thinking to join this uh, area of research we first calculate the volume fraction volume of polymer uh, and for mma it is 3.7133 this is for 4 ml of mma and mp is mass of polymer dp density of polymer and likewise we calculate the volume of filler uh, this is for 0.1 percent uh, of 3.7133 uh, polymer and volume fraction of filler and polymer are calculated by this uh, uh, equation vf by vp plus vf bp by bp plus vf so in this way you can easily uh, understand how we um, uh, take this polymer and filler and in what ratio we take uh, in different 0.1 percent filler 0.1 percent 0.2 percent and likewise so this is the um, experimental setup showing uh, the preparation of uh, pmma uh, cnt dope mw cnt Uh, doped PMMA. So we take uh, this polymer MMA in a uh, test tube, and we increase the temperature of the bath to 60 degree C, and then we uh, add benzyl peroxide 0.5 percent of MMA into this. Uh, also, this MW CNT is mixed earlier one. and we raise the raise the temperature of this bath to 70 degree c this is the optimized temperature we have observed and we start sonication so after uh, several hours of sonication ultra sonication we found uh, is polymerized the sample liquid is polymerized and we uh, break this uh, test tube and uh, we cut cut the sample in this shape from this uh, solid mass and this is the preparation of gic graphite intercalated compound and exfoliated graphite you see uh, we take uh, graphite with the sulfuric acid we take uh, concentrated concentric uh, sulfuric acid and nitric acid in 4 is to 1 ratio in a flask on the hot plate magnetic stirrer till 16 hours then then we vacuum filtering was done and washed with the water to neutralize the mixture after filtering the resultant uh, compound is shown like this this is the chemical reaction you all know Uh, what is going on in the formation of this compound this is the digital picture uh, we took uh, uh, what is happening inside the this is uh, we prepared this G, uh, eg by microwave uh, saw so how this uh, uh, exfoliated graphite is prepared you see gic prepared at room temperature is exfoliated by 750 watt for 20 seconds you see this much and at 50 degree c prepared gic when exfoliation was done at 850 watt for 20 seconds you see the increase in the volume 
expansion of sheet of the graphite because in graphite intercalation compound the uh, acid ions are in between the graphite layers that expands when we microwave this uh, material so up uh, there are numerous applications of conducting polymer composite these are used as anti static devices decoupling and embedded capacitor materials charge storing device material ptcr and ntcr materials for circuit protection devices uh, emi shielding material uh, it is used what is percolation th threshold that is denoted by phi c uh, because uh, this is polymer composite initially it is a um, insulator but when we increase the doping then insulator to conduct a transition observed in polymer composite and this is sharp at some particular vol volume fraction of the filler so at what volume friction of filler the conductivity increases rise uh, rapidly is called the percolation threshold uh, at this critical volume fraction of conducting filler the conductivity of the composite increases by several order of magnitude and uh, electrical as far as electrical properties of conducting polymer composite uh, this is well known power law model where t is the critical exponent its uh, value is in between 1.5 to 2 C, uh, uh, epsilon 0 is considered to be the conductivity of the filler and uh, this is the 10 delta uh, v plot all these things this is the uh, epsilon prime uh, is real and epsilon double prime is imaginary and ratio of this is known as 10 delta loss delta is the loss angle epsilon uh, prime is calculated by uh, cd epsilon 0 a where d is the thickness c is the capacitance a is the area of cross section of the pillet this the percolation in dielectric constant is given by this equation where u is the corresponding critical exponent this is the power law analysis electrical conductivity uh, from this we find uh, t is equal to 3.19 phi c is 0 0.018 uh, so the small volume uh, value of t indicating of the nano size of the mwcnt also we find the typical dielectric constant uh, versus phi phi is the filler volume fraction so large increase in epsilon dust at lower frequency epsilon dust uh, um, is found to be uh, 1244 in the nano composite having 0.15 uh, at 100 hertz high values of epsilon dust could be attributed to this is maxwell wagner's interfacial polarization that is happened in a heterogeneous composite system this is the variation of epsilon dust with frequency so high value at lower uh, frequency then it uh, decreases and become constant slope u is equal to 0.21 is in good agreement with the universal value 0.3 this is variation of 10 delta with frequency for pmma mwc and t nano composite strong frequency dependent similar to the behavior high values of 10 delta above phi c indicated large leakage current in the nano composite above phi c so this is the thermal properties we measured these are thermogravimetric curves of pure pmma and pmma mwc and t doped pmma for 0 0.055 and this is the corresponding dsc curve thermal analysis reveals that degradation behavior of uh, uh, neat pmma and pmma mwc and t nano composite the thermal decomposition temperature of this nano composite enhances as compared with the pure pmma This is the same uh, scanning electron micrographs showing uh, conducting chains in the nano composite. Uh, also shows 
MWC entities as bright agglomerates in the nanocomposite for higher phi due to emission of more secondary electrons from the conducting MWC NT as compared to insulating polymer matrix. This is the hardness uh, mechanical strength uh, D SOAR hardness meter. Uh, so you see the hardness decreases as the filler component in increases. Uh, decrease in hardness is related to less particle to particle interaction among the polymer matrix because of blending of MMA particles with MWCNTs within the nanocomposite. So this is the structural characteristics of XRD natural graphite, GIC and exfoliated graphite and uh, uh, as we have compared uh, these figures results uh, are in uh, we have to do some more uh, experiments on this this is the morphology of natural graphite flakes gic and exfoliated graphite so in conclusion we can say electrical conductivity of the nano composite exhibits insulator conductor transition low percolation threshold concentration uh, was uh, obtained at 0.18 volume fraction of MWCNT value of critical exponent T was found to be 3.19 with a standard deviation 0.5 percent high dielectric constant of the order of 4 into 10 to the power 3 at lower frequencies was found in uh, this composite for higher filler loading observed pattern of high dielectric constant at low frequency makes the nano composite suitable for utilization as charge storing device dielectric constant is found to be low frequency dependent while at higher frequency no change in the values of dielectric constant was observed easier results show the increase in thermal stability of this uh, nano composite with increase in uh, this filler component uh, homogeneous dispersion of MWCNTs within the polymer matrix has been observed from the scanning electron micrographs. At higher loading of MWCNT, agglomerate of MWCNTs within the polymer matrix form conducting chain of MWCNTs. Hardness of the nano composite is found to decrease with increase in volume fraction of this MWCNTs. We have prepared GIC and EG also. XRD and same have been done other measurements will be carried out so thank you uh, it is the last lecture and <laughs> you must be waiting for the end of this uh, so thank you again thank you, thank you professor Verma. Uh, now the last session is discussion and i ask uh, professor Verma to chair this session thank you pankaj so if anybody has any question uh please raise uh, oh you must type, some, type in the some. chat box yeah i think uh, i should propose a vote of thanks if any question comes uh, we can uh, send them through email that will there be better some, there are already some questions uh, okay one is that yeah, some questions are already answered. Ah, okay. so madam has answered. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, the questions which has come, they have been answered. Yeah, Pankaj, uh, the chat box you can see the questions. Yeah. My, uh, oh, the most the questions are answered, and maybe uh, if anybody has further questions. <laughs> They are uh, having your email, yeah, so they can, can write uh, to right. you directly, and you can get it answered from the expert and uh, send it to them. I think that will be better because it is already 120. 130. 130. It is a. Uh, <laughs> it is also an issue of data. Students. <laughs> Actually, this entire proceeding also is recorded, so it can be shared later. Yeah, 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 yeah.
So all, oh. all if, uh, if uh, so if you, otherwise, uh, those who have any question, they can uh, write to us. Uh, the representatives from Inter University Accelerator Center by email, and uh, those questions will be answered. Yeah. And then, Professor Burma, maybe you can uh, go ahead with a uh, vote of thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Golda, for giving me this opportunity to propose a vote of thanks. I am indeed thankful to your director, Professor A.C. Pandey, with, who knows me very well, uh, for granting our university to organize this uh, event, very uh, important event as far as the research of ion beams uh, in nuclear physics or material science is concerned. I am also thankful to you for taking a lot of pain during the organization of this event. Uh, I am also thankful to, from our side, Engineer Nidhi Asthana for making all the feedback form and certificates for the participants and uh, resource person. Uh, I am indeed thankful to your IUAC ICT group for nicely uh, um, managing the things uh, during the entire session of this uh, uh, webinar. And I am indeed thankful to Dr. Saif Ahmad Khan, uh, uh, Dr. Pankaj Kumar, you, and our panelist, uh, Professor Rajiv Manohar, Dr. Uday Bhan Singh. And also I am thankful to Professor R.K. Sukla, uh, a professor from University of Lucknow, Department of Physics, for uh, attending all the webinars we used to organize. And he, so, he, he showed his interest uh, in these scientific uh, proceedings organized by various universities and departments. Uh, so I am at the last, uh, I am thankful to all of you for cooperation and for organizing this event very beautifully. And we hope that in near, near future, we will hold another uh, event for our university jointly with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is- uh, Thank you very uh, much. Sorry, Wanda. Yeah. On our website, there is a movie about IUSC as well as newsletter is available. So all interested can watch that movie as well as uh, download the um, shirt or for the information. Madam, kindly send me the video of this event so that we can upload on our e departmental YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, it will be it will be shared. Yeah, it will be okay. Thank you. Okay. And if, if, if people can actually. Uh, uh, Contact our website for getting further information about different facilities and research programs at IUSC. So the contact details are also given in our homepage. So very nicely, Dr. Pankaj and Dr. Sahab presented your facilities and you yourself in nuclear physics. Uh, our student must be benefited by this presentation. Thank you. All of you Thank can you, make your camera on so that we can click the uh, screenshot. Yeah, it's better. Now everyone can switch on their camera for some time. Switch on your camera, please. Yes, that is there. Please switch on your camera.
Others, are, <coughs> others also can switch on their video, please. Devika Sukla, Sobna Dikchit, Asok Barma, Ajay Kumar Mishra, Avinash Kumar Mishra, Aryom Gupta, Harsh Gupta. You switch it to grid view. Yeah, I have switched it on the grid view, yeah. San Pandey and many more. Please switch on your video. Okay, it is done. Thank you. Okay, now we should leave, madam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Pankaj, okay. you can you. take a screenshot. I, I took already. Okay. Thank you, everybody from Ayuka. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. We will meet after this pandemic. Okay, I had been I had been to your institute. Uh, Please come again. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.